My name is Jane Guberman. Today is Friday, March 24th, 2017. And I'm here with Zev and Leslie Schenken at their home in Teaneck, New Jersey. And we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Zev and Leslie, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so I'd like to start uh, by talking with each of you about your personal and family background and to flesh out a bit who you were at the time that you first got involved um, with the New York Chabara. So Zeb, we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your family when you were growing up? And you were born in 1945 in San Antonio. Right, Texas. yes. I was born, I was born there because uh, my uh, father was in the Army, in the Army Air Corps, and, um, uh, and uh, my father was from San Antonio and my mother was from Laredo. Um, uh, my, but by coincidence, it's also a big Air Force base, so that's where he was stationed. He had already uh, uh, completed his missions in uh, in Europe. He flew 54 missions. Um, he came back and he was stationed in San Antonio, being trained to go over to Japan. Uh, anyway, I was born in '45. Um, what had brought your family briefly to to Texas? Well, my my father's family went to San Antonio from Chicago because uh, my father's older sister had asthma and the doctor said they needed a dry climate. And uh, my father's father uh, had uh, uh, a distant business connection, or actually um, uh, the person he was working for had a distant relative who uh, was the Korach brothers. They had a relative who was in San Antonio, so he took the family to San Antonio. Uh, my f uh, he was a traveling salesman, my father's father. Uh, my, uh, my mother, uh, was born and raised in Laredo, Texas. Uh, her father was an immigrant from uh, Russia, and um, uh, she was born there, and then she went to college in San Antonio. What did your parents do? My father was a rabbi in uh, Northeast. Uh, he went to the uh, JIR before it merged with HUC. Uh, after the war, he went to uh, college and, and to uh, rabbinical school. And he was a rabbi until um, uh, until uh, the late seventies, from about, uh, and uh, so I grew up. Uh, when I grew up, he was a rabbi, and then he went to uh, Israel for a few years, then came back and went back into the rabbinate, and then retired again. And now he lives in uh, um, in Florida with his second wife. Mm -hmm. And what did your mom do when you were growing up? She was a school teacher. Um, her training was in, uh, I think, history, but uh, she knew Spanish well, and so she was a Spanish teacher at Broadway High School. Uh, for um, uh, most, from about the time I was 10 years old to uh, when she retired. And you have a younger sister? I have a younger sister, yes, um, Olivia, uh, nine years younger, and um, she lives in New York City. New York City. So where did you live when you were growing up? In the Northeast, uh, a number of towns, uh, Pittston, Pennsylvania, Bridgeton, New Jersey, Dobbs Ferry, uh, New York, and then Cranford uh, from uh, 1958 to, uh, well, really to 60, uh, uh, yeah, 57 to 63, I guess, yeah. Following your father's pulpits, is that yes, what it Yes, of course, yeah. 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 Uh, let's, yeah. <clears throat> so what, what was the Jewish community like? Well, there were a conservative synagogue. It was my, my father's pul pulpits were in conservative synagogues. So he had, wait, he was... Um, ordained. He was in ordained. Uh, uh, no. Well, it, at that time it was not. At that time, the JIR was an in, independent rabbinical institution. Uh, Stephen S. Wise was the uh, main charismatic leader of it, and when he died, they couldn't really uh, hold it on, on their own. So then they merged with uh, HUC. Uh, so it became HUC. But there were a number of JIR graduates who uh, joined the rabbinical assembly, which was at that, at, or, originally it was just the graduate institution. It was, a great, it was like the alumni institution for the seminary, but then became part of the, the uh, official union uh, and uh, I suppose ideological uh, uh, handle for the, for the rabbis. So my father replied, he was, I think he was the first actually, J.A.R. graduate to apply because he believed very much in conservative duties of not in reform and he didn't, he didn't, want, a he didn't want reform synagogues. So um, uh, his first show I think was in, in well it was in, in Pittston, Pennsylvania and I think that officially was orthodox. The, but the second one was Bridgeton, New Jersey. Now, these are not, uh, see, the thing is, uh, in the 50s, um, th there was not a uh, Solomon Schechter kind of school. And so um, 
you either went to an Orthodox school, if there was one in the area, or, or you had to have home tutoring. So I had a kind of combination of that. Um, in, in, South, in Bridgeton, I really had nothing except for my father you know, to tutor me. There was a local Hebrew school, which I was in, but um, I didn't get as much Jewish education, you know, um, what we call academic stuff, um, mm -hmm. as, as, uh, as I wished I had, uh, as they could have given me. Um, but it was very, uh, as far as the family goes, I mean, we, you know, uh, we were very involved in Jewishness. Now, how would you describe the Jewish environment in your home? You were the son of the rabbis, right. uh, children of the rabbi. It was very, um, we were very, cons very conscious of our Judaism. Um, uh, kosher Shabbat, synagogue, um, and uh, often my father would talk about Jewish ideas. Uh, at the table, you know, uh, we would talk about uh, ideas, and a lot of them were Jewish, um, mm -hmm. high level. Um, but I mean, there are other aspects, but you're asking about the Jewish part. And I think it was pretty, uh, um, uh, you know, I was observant even in, in those communities, sometimes uh, having to explain it to my non Jewish friends in the neighborhood. Yeah. That's another thing. <laughs> See, I, I found, you know, I talked to other rabbis' kids over the years, and if, uh, my uh, same age group, my cohort level. And they all have had a similar experience. A lot of them are born in faraway places, because especially if they're firstborns, because that's where their father's getting started. <laughs> and also, they um, uh, had a lot of experience with uh, non-Jewish kids, you know. Uh, and they're also because they're not in a. Often they can't, they can't afford the Jewish neighborhoods, because the synagogue can't afford. So we we never lived in a Jewish neighborhood, <laughs> uh, because the synagogue was paying. It was parsonage, you know. The synagogue would pay for the house, so it was never in a good, particularly it was usually lower middle class neighborhood. Um, the gilded ghettos were far away. I would have to walk. I remember when I lived in Cranford, I'd walk about ten blocks on Shabbos to the Jewish to my play with my Jewish friends. <laughs> uh, you said that um, <laughs> your it was expected that your observance would represent the standards of the conservative movement. You as the, as the children of the rabbi. I said that in the uh, in the pre-interview. Right, I had written that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We were we were uh, what do they call it? Uh, fishbowl or something like that. You know. Uh, we were observed, yes, uh, and although it was, they were often claimed, but it wasn't the case. It was. I remember one time I would ride my bike on Shabbos. That was like a big issue because it seems like the Orthodox. I, I, I didn't know that because now I still see it. Very Orthodox kids riding their bikes on Shabbos. For some reason, there were some chnyaks uh, in one of the congregations that uh, uh, thought it was really uh, not proper that the rabbi's son uh, ride his bike on Shabbos. Um, I'd forgotten that until now. So, but that was a story that, that was, so there was, there was that kind of pressure. Mm. So a key element. But I didn't it. resent it because I, I, I mean, I enjoyed, there was a lot of positive stuff about being Jewish that I got from uh, my mother and my father. My mother too was very, um, uh, very much in, in love with Jewishness. She was not raised as, a, neither my father nor my mother were raised in an observant way. My father had a kind of calling after his bar mitzvah. He got very interested in it, and then he decided to be a rabbi. Uh, his parents were, you know, Jewish and nationalistic Jewish. They, don't, they didn't keep a kosher home. Uh, there have been stories about when my father decided to keep kosher, you know, a high school kid, and, and uh, he would get furious, you know, if they would serve trey in his house. You know, and there were, like, fights in the family. So uh, that you hear about, you know, in other families, too. He was in that situation. Yeah. You mentioned just now um, the sort of nationalistic um, part of identity, and a key element in your family's Jewish identity was their relationship to Israel. Yes. What 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 were your parents' relationships to Israel and their thoughts on it? Um, so you were born in 1945, just before the state, and sort of grew up during the early years of um, Israel's existence. It was uh, one of the main dreams of my father uh, to someday go to Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, he had, when he was overseas, he was in Italy, and he had the opportunity uh, to go AWOL and go to visit Palestine just for a few days, not, you know, for per and uh, he didn't. A friend of his did, uh, and uh, got caught, but it wasn't dangerous, just got, you know, a little, little discipline. But that friend actually made Aliyah later on. But the thing is that it was always a dream of my father, and in the family, it was often a, uh, uh, a big part of Judaism was, was Israel. Uh, uh, he was fascinated by the uh, um, you know, ability of Jews to um, uh, make, have their own country and um, revive everything, their culture. He also, um, 
it was uh, he, see he had been a bombardier navigator in World War II. So when he was in the seminary, when he was a rabbinical school, he was approached by some of the Zionists to go over and fight in the Liberation War, because um, you know he, he knew he didn't know how to fly, but he probably couldn't figure it out. But he, he was a navigator, and uh, and he had really planned to go over. Um, and the the family story is that uh, my. Uh, my mother's father, who had a bad heart condition and had had a heart attack, uh, said he did on his it's like on his deathbed he didn't want his uh, daughter to uh, to die in Israel or in Palestine. So uh, you know they were like pleading with him not to go, and he didn't go. And he already had a son. Uh, he was that you know so uh, he didn't go. But that was like one of his frustrations. But but that's like a family story as far as like ideology politics are concerned about. It was uh, very strongly in, in favor of Israel and very uh, proud of uh, what was done. I, I have a memory of being awakened uh, when I was, uh, I guess, three years old. I was still on a height in a crib. Um, and I had a grogger that played Hatikva with the, Jew, you know, the Jewish flag. <laughs> And it was, I think, it was the night that the that they the, the uh, you know in '48 the independence uh, happened when the UN declared. I think because uh, I, I, I remember where I was living. Uh, my father was in uh, Pleasantville at that time, uh, Pleasantville Cottage School. He was, going, well, he was going to rabbinical school. He had a congregation. Uh, you know, it's like the, uh, it's the 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 rabbi of the uh, uh, it's orphanage basically, uh, Jewish orphanage in in Pleasantville. And that's where that's where he was in '48, and so I think that's what happened. So it was a big deal. Did and then ever, I went. Did what? he ever go? Did you ever go? To yes, Israel? his first time in Israel was my first time in 1958. He uh, uh, he took me for my bar mitzvah, my bar mitzvah trip with, uh, to Israel, mm -hmm. and he got the job to be the counselor of the group. Uh, what group was it? It was a group that was put together by the Jewish Agency. A lot of it was uh, we stayed at Chabad Hanorat Zimni, the uh, Goldstein village. But it was a, um, a, a, um, a uh, what do they call it? A composite group of a number of different uh, uh, youth movements and just general people wanted to go to Israel. Uh, it was a very well organized trip. Uh, it was 1958. Uh, I've since taken a lot of trips, kids to Israel, and it's really the Jewish agency, the Sochnut, is now a very well oiled machine as far as kids going and as far as doing the pro in those days it was not. Uh, Were you the only kid on the trip? No, I was the, I was the only rabbi's son on the trip. <laughs> I was the only son of the uh, of the director. <laughs> he, he was the director of the trip. He'd never been to Israel, but he was the director of the trip. He did not understand that. <laughs> he got the job thinking that he was going to be like the kind of sort of spiritual leader. But when he got there, they said, you are the director of the Americans, and there was a woman who was the director of the Jewish Agency group. So they, she was basically, but she didn't do any of the, um, she just scheduled the trips. You see, she didn't do any direct, I still remember this, I was 13, I still remember, because uh, my father really didn't know what he was doing, but uh, you know, he managed to work it out. Um, uh, you know, it's not that hard, but uh, I mean, I've seen what good directors do since then. Uh, Anyway, that was his first time in Israel, and he loved it. <laughs> uh, and what about uh, you? I, I uh, Do you remember. I remember oh. it. Yeah, yeah, I remember it. Uh, I haven't thought about it, but I remember. I mean, in a long time. I, well, yeah. One problem was I was the youngest kid there, and the second I was the uh, the director's son. So um, there was some kind of you know it was a, an awkward position. More I think because I was the youngest than because I was the director's son. Because uh, you know they had to squeeze me in, you know. They, <laughs> Uh, most of the kids were 16 and 17. I was 13, so it was an awkward thing. Um, but um, uh, we went to a lot of nice places. And the biggest thing, of course, there and also in, uh, when I was back in 65 was the, um, it was, you know, before the Six Day War. And so you would you'd go up, you know, you'd be able to see over into Jordan where the old city is, and you could see where the wall is, the Kotel. Um, and we would, uh, you know, th that was one of the interesting things about it. Mm. You started to talk earlier a little bit about your Jewish education and how uneven it was. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your education actually consisted of and where you went to school? Well, uh, the Hebrew school, when uh, I was, um, how much detail should I go into, Leslie? <laughs> I think you're going into way too much detail, yeah, yeah. frankly. So I got, yeah, okay, so I got, I had, um, uh, you know, uh, at fifth and sixth grade, I was at Akiba Hebrew Academy, and then seventh and eighth grade, I was at a, a strong yeshiva, very, a very orthodox yeshiva in Elizabeth. And then in high school, I went to the Prozdor uh, 
in uh, the seminary. And, um, and then I uh, took Hebrew courses at college and I uh, took uh, courses uh, on my own at uh, the seminary uh, when I was in college. Yeah. yeah. Were you interested in, in your Jewish education when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you were also actively involved in USY as a teenager. Yes. What, what kind of experience was that for you? And a lot you, of fun. How did it impact your identity, would you say? Well, uh, it was fun because it was, um, now I look back, one of the fun things about it was it was with Amicha. It was like, uh, it was kind of Jews who were, uh, uh, you know, had fun being Jewish. Uh, they weren't particularly educated, you know, USY, uh, and um, they were, um, I mean, you know, Jewishly educated, but they were nice people. It was my primary social group, and I loved them. Um, so after graduating from high school, when, when did you graduate from high school? 63. 63. So it was after that that you spent a year in Israel at the Machal the Madrid the Hutzlar. That's right, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that was a, a World Zionist organization that had been founded in like 46 to... Well, the, the, uh, the Machon, it's an it's a institute mm -hmm. for youth leaders from abroad. It's like a program uh, for uh, people from different youth movements. And they would come for a year and learn how to be good, better youth movement and more educated youth leaders. And they would go back to their different youth movements. This is based upon, you know, the European idea of a youth movement which doesn't really fit into American model. But in Europe, I mean, all the Zionists, every, if you were Zionist, you joined a youth movement that had a certain ideology. And that ideology is what, you, was, what was informing your, your desire to go to Israel. And, what you were gonna, and when you got to Israel, that's why you have so many parties, because all the different, <laughs> different youth movements became po political parties. Uh, so they had an institute in Israel uh, under the Sochnut, the Jewish Agency's auspices, that was um, educating all the youth leaders from abroad for, into, into Zionism and things like that, so that they go back to their local countries, <laughs> they go back to their countries, and they're committed for two years to then work in that movement's, um, in, in that movement. And so then if it was unusual, a Kalutzik group, they're supposed to make Aliyah. Were you, were you unusual as an American in that context? No, there are a lot of Americans, but the, the unusual was that um, <clears throat> we were... Uh, uh, we, we didn't really, well, some of us did, but USY doesn't fit into the model of a youth movement in a Zionist way. It's not a Zionist youth movement, but it, it fit in. There was also but a lot of young Judea kids, that's a Zionist movement of Americans. There were a lot of Americans there. Have Canadian, you ever been Judea. involved with young in Judea? No. no. Just, it wasn't what we were doing in our synagogue. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up at this Bukhon? USY. The, the, the USY, the United Synagogue, uh, um, uh, uh, decided that it would be very good to have its, uh, uh, its, its, you see, I was, at that time, U.S. was for high school kids, I was in college, but I was learning how to be a, a good, effective, Jewishly educated, Zionist educated um, uh, uh, youth leader. And then I did go back and I worked, in, you know, I was like the advisor for a youth movement, for U.S.Y. I think that's a little bit off the track. I mean, it's, it's not that much of a big deal, except I spent a year in Israel and the Mahal and Madrid came, yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you at all interested yourself in making Aliyah at that point? Yeah, I thought about it, but not that seriously. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, so let's just talk about your undergraduate and graduate education a little bit. So you went to Long Island University and then to Seton Hall University. Right, you have a master's from Seton Hall University, yes. Mm -hmm. And what were you studying during that period? English. English. Mm -hmm. what, what was driving you to study English? Uh, I, I, liked, I liked literature, I liked poetry, and I wanted to uh, learn more about it. Uh, I, uh, I started out, I think, I think my uh, freshman year, I think my major was political science, but I um, soon got more interested in literature. When I was in Israel, it was fun, you know, because we would I mean, have television and I would read a lot. <laughs> and it would be a place where, yeah, you, know, you go to Stamatsky's, which is a foreign language bookstore, and uh, I mean, and you'd meet a lot of people there, and uh, um, and and uh, I guess there I became more aware of uh, English as my language, and so I became more sensitive to it. Maybe that was it. Yeah. What about were you were you fluent in Hebrew? Mm, uh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so these were years, your college years, and and. Um, and then later into your graduate school years were years of uh, 
tremendous social ferment here in the United States among, Amer among American youth generally with the development of the counterculture and anti-war activities, the civil rights movement. Um, to what extent, if at all, were you involved with and influenced by these larger movements? Well, the civil rights movement I was very involved with. How so? Uh, I, I, I participated in desegregating activities in, uh, um, with SNCC, a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, in uh, Cambridge, Maryland. I, and I would go down there on weekends when I was in college. And, um, and I spent two weeks down there uh, during, uh, I think, maybe spring break I spent and, uh, and a little bit in the uh, beginning of that summer. Uh, that was 1965. Yeah, we worked on desegregating activities. Um, uh, and voter registration. So we would go to black, uh, we, we stayed in a black neighborhood and uh, home hospitality and we would uh, then uh, get in our cars and <clears throat> uh, go out to the um, areas to uh, try to get, um, well sometimes we would desegregate. So we would go as a, an ex group at a lunch counter, for example, to sit down and, and wait to be served or wait to be admitted. <laughs> and, and one time in, in our, in, uh, in Cambridge, Maryland, I, I, I filed a suit. Uh, I sued uh, the store for not allowing me in, uh, and we, we won. About, uh, about three months later, I got a letter uh, from uh, the, cap the capital of Maryland, Baltimore, <laughs> I guess. I don't remember now. But saying, you know, that uh, in my suit, I had won the suit. I don't think I... Got any damage. I should have saved it. It would have been a great souvenir. But we did desegregate that store. Fiesenfeld, that was the name of the store. And uh, it was a Jewish name, but he didn't look Jewish. But Were you down there with a college group? I was down there with the, it was NYU Friends of SNCC. That was the group, yeah. Uh, and uh, then uh, that summer I went down with, um, uh, this is more interesting because there were some, uh, this was with a Jewish, some kids I had known from USY. Um, Mickey Schur, who became very firm later, and Peter Geffen, who you may be interviewing, actually. He was one of the people who, who was one of the founders of the Cup Morale. Uh, he was down there. He told me about it. And so I went down there, and a lot of them were down Columbia where? students. Where? That was, Or that was uh, Orangeburg, South Carolina. Orangeburg, South Carolina. And that, I was there for, I think, three weeks. Um, and there we went to cotton fields, and we went to churches. <laughs> Well, Mickey, Mickey Schur, not Moshe Schur, he was very dynamic. And Sunday mornings we would go to churches, black churches, to get them to make, and, and we were given, the, they allowed us to speak, to tell them that they should go and register to vote because this was uh, unknown to a lot of them about voter registration uh, and how to vote. And they were afraid too. So, you know, we would, uh, I only spoke once, very a little bit, but Mickey had such fire. He was really great. Uh, and uh, I mean, he became a rabbi, so uh, you know, and, and he, had, he was very dynamic, he was beautiful. Um, I want to interject <laughs> one thing that Zeb's father, who was a rabbi, was a freedom writer. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's in his background, too, is a very important influence for this involvement. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You want to say a few words about that? That was summer of what? what, what well, my father was a freedom writer earlier when I was in high school, uh, oh. you know, in the because uh, the freedom riders were uh, the beginning of the desegregating right. movement. So I was in the early 60s, uh, I think 60, 61. Uh, yeah, I think I was a sophomore in high school when it was done. Uh -huh. he Did went you down go there. down during Freedom Summer? Uh, the freedom Summer is a little later. Freedom 60, Summer, 60. and he wasn't, no, this, this is before Freedom Summer. Right. I was a year after Freedom Summer. I was 60. Five, mm -hmm. and the the famous Freedom of Summer, I think, is '64. You can check that. Um, uh, but we already knew, basically. You know, we were following in heroes that we had known about. <laughs> in, but, but my father, he was uh, uh, he was asked to go, uh, and he went oh, a number of times. Freedom riding meant you went on buses, in a desegregated, in a mixed group, and you would uh, go to the uh, lunch counters in the uh, those restaurants, at the. Uh, of, of that, that belonged to the, the bus terminal, you see. That was the legal issue, that was the big deal, because then it becomes interstate commerce, and so the state's rights issues couldn't be, that's why it became, that's what the whole thing. So um, uh, he would go there, and then uh, at night he would uh, make sermons um, to, you know, he'd speak at the church. Did you ever go with him? No, no, I was too young. Uh, but he also went down to Selma, uh, yeah. Some Alabama, you know, the was famous Was he part march. of the rabbinic sort of delegation? Yes, yeah. yes he was, yes. 
It was one of the, uh, yeah, yeah, he was. So he was, must have been a big influence on you and in supporting you in your yes, yes, efforts. He, yes, 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 he was. Uh -huh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the, How what did other? you feel as a Jew in, in, the, in the civil rights movement? I felt great about it. I was very proud that uh, a lot of other Jews were doing it. Um, I, I, saw, I saw what would then become a greater tension, uh, particularly in uh, Orangeburg, uh, because, I mean, you know, we were college kids, so we had a real sense of how to organize stuff. Uh, I mean, just like daily organization, you know? Like, uh, we have so many cars, we have so many people, uh, the thing is this far away, we have these jobs to do. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were middle class kids and we we're working with lower class, we we're working with worker class kids. So there was a tension because it was, often it was white Jewish guys giving the black kids orders. Um, not always, but, it, and, and uh, there was a slight tension about it. Um, that then became... That was palpable, you, could, you were aware of it. It was palpable. It was, then became... It was palpable because, I mean, all right, you're going to do it, you, go ahead, do it. And they, it's really, I mean, it's the day-to-day -day life of organization, you know, office ma being an office manager, it's a real hard job. Uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, of course, a lot of... And also, also uh, we were often older than the, kid, than the black kids we were working with, you see. So we would be working with, we, we were college kids, we were working with kids maybe f three or four years younger than us, that's just the way it usually happened. I don't know why, now that I think about it. But uh, some of them were our age, but most of them seemed to be younger. It's a long time ago, I don't remember it that well. Yeah. Uh, but it's, 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 thank you, Leslie, for pointing out, yeah, my father was in it too, yeah. Uh, what other things about the 60s uh, film had, had it influence us? What about the anti-war movement? Were you involved at all? Was your dad involved or your mother? My dad was late to the anti-war movement. My dad, you see, is very mixed because he <clears throat> he was very pro-Zionist and he understood what it's like to be a minority from his uh, Jewish experience, but he also understood what it's like to be a soldier. And uh, he was late to being uh, in opposition to the war in Vietnam. I was a lot earlier. <laughs> uh, but he finally did come around, but uh, much mm -hmm. later. When uh, did you start to become... Almost from the beginning. I, I went to a teach-in when I was a sophomore. Uh, when we, that's when we became aware of it. That was, what, 64? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's when everybody started realizing what was going on. And uh, I <laughs> realized it, too. Yeah. And I think I did argue with my dad, yeah. We would argue. We'd have arguments about it. Um, so were you involved in anti-war demonstrations and yeah. such? Yeah, but it was a different kind of thing from, I mean, civil rights, you desegregate, but to do a demonstration, I mean, a, a, a direct action, is what you, uh, with the anti-war movement, you mean like burning draft cards and things like that? No, I didn't do that. Oh, I, I mean, I, I would go in demonstrations, but uh, I mean, I, I, felt, I feel I put my body on the line for civil rights a lot more than I did for the peace movement, if, if that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so then, going back to Israel for one minute, you were, you were still an undergraduate when the Six-Day War happened. Yes. Yeah. And um, I, I came back. See, I was on my phone for a year. Then I came back to America, uh, and then the Six-Day War broke out in, the, in, the, in June of 67. So, so then I went back. you on the phone in the middle of your college years? Yes, that? that's right. I yeah. Okay. It's like junior year abroad. So I, my junior year abroad was, uh, was Mahon and Madrahim. Then I came back to America for sort of my senior year, but, but then when the Six-Day War broke out, it was the end of that year, uh, and, and so I went over there as a volunteer. And the idea was a volunteer, we would do the work that, that the, uh, the, mostly kibbutz was a really, that's another thing, you know, we've got to talk about it. it was all really, kibbutz was the thing. It used to be, you know, you send somebody to Israel in the 60s, they come back a socialist. Send somebody to Israel, now they come back from, right? Right, <laughs> right. But, uh, so we, we, uh, we, I mean, everything, if you were Zionist in, uh, in our time, it meant, you know, and you could still a little bit, certainly in the early 60s, find a marriage between Zionism and civil rights uh, and perhaps even the peace movement. If you look, uh, if you look, you know, at certain of the uh, Zionist, uh, the more ideological, a uh, more idealistic Zionists, you know, like Can all the stuff like that. I meant that there, there were, um, 
considerations uh, in the beginning of the issue about, you know, what is the what is our Jewish presence going to be here? And some felt that it should be a kibbutz, you know, that we should always social. Uh, some felt that we don't have to have actually a state with sovereignty, but we can be an entity uh, where we can have a Jewish culture. Um, that there should be a state where we can have interrelations with the Arabs that we can give. You know, there's all these kinds of things. So it didn't always it, the, the form that it took. Now we look back, of course, it always looks inevitable, but it didn't have to be. So we looked a little bit to those writers and to those thinkers and that thought process, you see, to think that um, uh, it, it might still be possible to, to have this marriage of civil rights and, and you know, upper middle class uh, Jews uh, identifying uh, uh, with, um, with the socialists, with workers of the world. Um, so. How did the Six Day War affect you personally? You th did it have an impact on your sense of Jewish identity, your ideas about Israel? Yeah, I was very proud the first few days, and I remember the last day of the... I was over there, I was like the last plane out of America. Uh, and uh, uh, when we got there, uh, everything was dark, and it was a blackout, and they, we drove up to... They took us to a kibbutz where we, we did the work because the soldiers were, you know, the kibbutz and the kibbutz were all in the field. All in the, um, Are you talking about uh, June, or was it later than that? I'm talking about right before the Six-Day War. Right before. June. June. So right before. The, the, day, the day before the Six-Day War, I got there. And, and, and there was a blackout uh, at night. And uh, we were driving carefully, because we didn't want to put our headlights on. A cab, a Sheirut, took, us, uh, took me and about four other American volunteers up to a, a kibbutz in the Galil. Um, no lights. Uh, in fact, the guy next to me said, this is like really the wilderness. He had never been to Israel. And we got there, and, and um, the, basically the kibbutz said, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know? We said, the Saknut said, this was for the volunteer. We're gonna, they said, okay, good, good. So they gave us jam, and, and they put us on a, in a, a kibbutz, in a uh, trif, a um, cabin. cabin. And uh, the next day, we dug trenches. Um, and... Um, uh, then the uh, and then there was a air raid and we uh, went to the um, the shelter. What what kibbutz were you on? Hasolalim. Uh, and there there were a lot of Americans there. That's probably why they sent us there. You know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the thing is that um, after well, by the uh, there's an interesting story about it. So one of the Americans named David. Um, uh, he. Uh, this is about the fifth day of the war. We already knew that we had won. Uh, and it was like, I think, a Friday night, and the lights went out. We, oh, yeah, it was, we were in the Chaler Ochel. It was all dark because there was a blackout in the Galil, and they didn't want any, you know, they didn't want the Syrians to see it. And then um, somebody came in and turned the lights on, and everybody realized what that meant. <laughs> that you know, there was no, no more any danger that we would be attacked by, uh, by Syria. And so there was great applause, great applause, great cheer. Um, the next day, uh, David's daughter uh, and he were arguing because he had heard uh, that um, there was looting. And in Jerusalem? Where? In no, he had heard that the Jewish soldiers were looting in Kenetra. And he was outraged. And she said, well, they would have done worse to us. And, and, he, and this is all in Hebrew. He said, you know, he went on to, where's your Jewish ethics? How can you do this? And she, you know, was, uh, uh, but it was also interesting was he had such a thick American accent, you know, and she had a real Israeli accent. And she was saying, look, they would have done worse to us. What do we loot? We take a television, big deal, you know. But he said, no, we're not supposed to loot. This is what Jewish soldiers do. So a few days later, I said to him, what are we going to do with the territories? He said, well, we'll form a greater Israel. In other words, he was that, what's the word, casual? No, uh, unaware, split, schizo about it. That on one hand, he was outraged about the looting. On the other hand, uh, the territory, we'll form a greater Israel, he said, with a kind of wink. You know, so we'll have, you know, now we'll be an empire. Now we'll be an empire. I understood both sides, but I was so, I, I saw in him that kind of conflict um, that I thought, and the conflict with his daughter, because the, the, the difference between her good Israeli accent, she was a sovereign, his American, and the, his sensibilities, outraged at the looting, but uh, then saying, form a greater Israel. Strange, I don't know what happened to him, but uh, 
that really was a tearing part, you know, a, con a conflict. So uh, from the beginning, um, it was an issue. And I remember, I was, then I enrolled, I decided I might as well finish college in Israel, so I enrolled at Hebrew University. And I remember on the campus, uh, there were big arguments, debates, uh, you know, about what to do. And one guy said, you know, we fought this war and we want the hapri. I said, so remember, hapri, we want the fruits of our victory. <laughs> hapri. A and um, others said, no, we have to give it back. Uh, see, there was precedent. Ben Gurion uh, had said we should give it all back right away. Also, he was the prime minister when they gave back Sinai uh, for the, the Sinai uh, campaign in the 56. So, uh, it, 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 now it may seem outlandish to give it back, but it seemed then, to, you know, a lot of people wanted to give it back, but a lot of people in labor, too, wanted to colonize, colonize it. People came up to me, I still remember this, and I talked about it, right, Leslie, you know, uh, saying, uh, look, asking, because they wanted to go to the, you know, we were idealists, right, so they were to approach us. This is like when we were, we were watching debates on, on the campus, on the grass, you know, but, you know, we want to say, come join us. We're going to form a garin on the West Bank, and you can still go to college. We'll, you know, commute. It won't be that far, and then you don't have to live there. But just say as as your presence. So when we have to give it back, it'll, we won't be able to give it back because we'll say this is your settlement there. In other words, from the very start, at least a number of people felt the reason for the settlements was was deliberately to be an obstacle to giving it back echoing what happened back in the, uh, in the um, uh, mandate days when they decided the Jewish lines would go according to Jewish settlements. You know, that's where the borders were. Uh, so I, I, was, um, I was disheartened and I, I had a feeling that, you know, it wasn't going to be good. On the other hand, it was really thrilling to be there in Israel, to be a young man in Israel, um, healthy young man in Israel uh, without, without my, my, not much money problems. Um, and uh, it was just a great time. I wouldn't have traded it for anything in the world. We're talking politics. I don't know if we should. Yeah, no, we should be. <laughs> Other things to talk about, too. So you came, you came back, however, at the end of that, at the end of that year. Why did you right. come back in the end? I didn't feel I could really have, I didn't see a real future for me in Israel at the time. I didn't see it. I mean, I was majoring in, I, I had bit off more than I could chew as far as majoring and it was concerned. It was a different system, uh, college system. Uh, say I wasn't on a program. Uh, some people at the university are on, on programs, it's all predetermined. I made it my own program with an advisor who really um, didn't really care much, you know. Uh, basically, I said, can I take these <laughs> 20 courses? And he said, yeah, you can take them. <laughs> uh, and, I, and, and so I was, uh, I, I didn't feel that the semester, the year was successful uh, as far as any future was concerned. And I decided to cut my losses, go back uh, to America, finish up college. That's what I did. So you came back, finished college, so you graduated in... Uh, I graduated, I think, in 70. 70, because yeah. you had to make up time. But yeah, this yeah. Point. Yeah, and then we got married. Ah, and so that brings us to Leslie. Your turn. Yes. So Leslie, let's now turn to you and, and your family and background to the point that you both got involved in the in Kabbalah. So you were born in 1945. In also, Albany. in Albany, New York. Tell us about your family. When you were growing up. Uh, my father was a kosher butcher. He took over the business from my maternal grandfather, who was a kosher butcher. Okay. My father grew up in New York. Uh, my mother grew up in Albany. They met at a dance at the 92nd Street Y when my mother was in school in New York. Um, she was at uh, Parsons School of Design. She wanted to be a fashion designer. She then quit her job at the beginning of the war, went back to Albany and polished guns in the gun factory for the duration of the war. So she went back in order to be part of the war effort. Exactly, the exactly. And my father enlisted, and he was also in the Army Air Corps, and he was also a navigator. But he never saw action. He just kept getting trained on different planes throughout the United States. You know, he'd get trained, they'd think they were going overseas, and 24 hours later, they were being transferred to another airfield to train on a different plane. So, was lucky, he was, wasn't wounded, he didn't see action. Um, so I was born in Albany while my father was still in the Army. And actually in Albany itself? 
in Albany itself. And um, he came home. We live with my grandparents. And he came home when I was 14 months old. Wow. So he had been home somewhere in there. Uh, well, he, was, he came. They got married in Sioux City, Iowa. He was based there? He was based there. My mother went out there. My mo they got married. My mother got pregnant. She came home to Albany. What was it like growing up in, in Albany for you? What um, kind of neighborhood did you live in? Uh, I lived in a Catholic neighborhood, actually, for most of my life. Uh, but the, the, the Jewish community in Albany was a very strong, tight community. And the convergence of personalities in that community in the 50s made it a very unique experience. Um, the rabbi, I don't know if you ever heard of him, his name was Herman Kival. He was one of the bright lights of the conservative movement. Um, and we had a Hebrew school which was run by a very unusual educator named Philip Arian. He was so charismatic that you wanted to go to Hebrew school. You wanted to go to services Friday night and Saturday. It was your whole life. So this was true for lots of kids, you're saying, who went to yeah, this congregation. Yeah, yeah. And, and in, this congregation happened to have produced some um, uh, young people who went very far in um, academia. Uh, and I mentioned them in that questionnaire. One was Robert Alter, who I don't know if you've heard of. Uh, and the other was um, Bob Chazen. Okay, who was a professor for a long time in Indiana, and his younger brother, Barry. Uh, so these were the role models that I had as a kid. And then when I was um, nine years old, I went to Camp Ramah. They were already there. And how did you end up going to Ramah? It was because of this congregation? And the it, was be it was because of the congregation and the role model of all the kids before me who went. Tell us a little bit more about your, your, the environment in which you were growing up. So everybody was Catholic. Um, most families had five or six kids in them. And I had a neighbor who would sit on my front steps with me and we would talk about whether the Jews really killed Jesus or not. And this was a conversation that we would have over and over and over again. So on this street, there were probably upwards of 30 kids in elementary school. At that point, I was the only Jewish kid. And there was one other girl down the street who was Protestant. So when we would play games, all the Catholic kids went first then the Protestant kid, and then I was last. How did that affect you? When well, you were a child? if you wanted to play, that's what you did. As I got older, and I had more and more activities off the street, um, it became a non-issue, actually. How did your family end up living in such a Catholic neighborhood? Um, well, Albany had a strong Jewish community, but it wasn't a lot of people. So the house that we lived in at that point, which we moved into when I was eight, uh, well, let me give you some background. I lived with my grandparents till I was 14 months old. Then my parents and I moved into a, GA, a GI housing project. You know, lots of families in these small apartments. And then when I was, um, I guess about four and a half, we moved into a, a two-family house. We had the bottom flat, and there were people upstairs who owned the house. Then when I was eight, we moved to this other house, which was a duplex. It was an enormous house, both of them connected on a corner, which my grandparents owned. So we moved in, my parents paid rent, and eventually my parents bought it for my grandparents. So this was the neighborhood I grew up in, and um, I used to walk to Shoal, every Saturday morning. So it wasn't that far from the show? Well, it was a good 20 blocks away. 
It, w it was a hike. Um, and I went to public school, and I went to Hebrew school three times a week. And it was, it was a given that I would go to Hebrew high school. It wasn't a question, should she or shouldn't she. It's it was an after a given. school Hebrew high school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. most of the kids in your shul did the same? I would say 50% of them continued on into Hebrew high school. And Hebrew high school, the courses we took were so interesting that it made you want to learn, bottom line. It was a very unusual situation. Um, some of the teachers were uh, immigrants from Europe, some of them were American-born, some of them were Israeli. While that was going on, my mother um, was chairman of the Youth Commission of the Shul, which was the, uh, oversaw all the youth activities in the shul, and my father ended up being a vice president in the shul. So we lived there, basically. So that, was that your primary social environment, was yeah, the shul? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, my parents belonged to a group that they called the Cousins Club. My grandparents by that point had moved to Florida, so my parents had no relatives in Albany, and these other four families also didn't have any relatives in Albany. That was the criteria for becoming part of this group, which would then celebrate holidays together. Sort of a proto... Exactly, Chavara. like a proto Chavara. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And Bob Alter's parents were part of this group. You know, so there was, I was this little kid looking up to these guys, you know? You also got involved in USY. I got very involved in USY. We also had a different group called LTF. Mm -hmm. Leaders Training Fellowship. You had to be going to Hebrew school three times a week to participate in that group. And that group was uh, a little less social, a little more educational. So it was people who were fairly serious. Like yeah, that, yeah, about their exactly. Jewish identity and Jewish education. Exactly. So if, if USY had a dance on a Saturday night, LTF would stay up all night on Shavuos studying, often in my basement. <laughs> so, uh, so, and then when I was um, uh, nine and a half, I went to Ramah for the first time. So prompted by uh, these examples. By this environment, these, yeah. exactly. And all these kids who were there before me. Uh, and Ramah wasn't very old in 1954. It was a pretty new camp. It was in Connecticut. It was when my parents came up to visit me on visiting day, their jaws dropped at the conditions in the camp. They couldn't believe that anybody would allow their children to be. What it was, were the conditions like? It was a broken down camp that the seminary bought that had been built in the 20s. It was literally big log cabins. Um, it was, you know, now as an adult, when I look back, I can see why they eventually sold it as soon as they could and, and bought uh, Ramon the Berkshires. What did you feel? Which is in Palmer. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. The only problem I had was um, uh, they didn't allow you to talk to your parents on the phone. So I figured out how to sneak a collect call every week. I wasn't homework. I was homesick, but I had to talk to my parents every week. And I figured out the best time to sneak a phone call was during Havdalah. Because the entire camp was gathered together uh, for Havdalah. It was dark, right? Nobody would notice if a kid was gone. So I would sneak up to the payphone in the office and make a collect call every Saturday night. And no one ever figured and it out. And nobody ever figured it out. What did you take from your experience with Ramah? What, what did... It, it made living a Jewish life, it normalized it. That's probably the best way to put it. Because you were with all Jewish people in an all Jewish environment, uh, learning about Jewish things, and then learning about other things too. Like when Zev mentioned um, when he became aware of the war in Vietnam, I remember very clearly, it was 1964, I was in camp. Somebody decided we had to talk about Vietnam. 
That was pretty early. It was. And, and so we were... Um, and you were young. And we were young, right. In 1964, I was 18. And you were a camper or a counselor? In 1964, well, I went to Ramah as a camper. Then I spent a summer in the Poconos in a special program called Mador, which was a counselor training program. You could be a CIT, a junior counselor, and a counselor, or you could go to Mador for a summer and go from that to being a full counselor. And you made a commitment of two years. How old were you when you went to the Mador program? Um, 17. I guess 17, about to turn 18. It was between, my, my, uh, between high school and my freshman year of college. Tell us a little bit about that program. What did, what did they do? What, what was it like for you? Um, I learned about things that I never had encountered before. I learned about um, the Sumerians. Okay, I mean, how many kids learn about the Sumerians and Gilgamesh and, and its connection to creation stories in the Bible when they're 17 years old? And why was that? Why did they decide? They decided it was educational. That, that chinuchi, that was the, the code word for anything that they wanted us to do. You know, it was chinuchi, therefore it was considered appropriate to do. Uh, we learned, in a way, how to be counselors. The idea was to attempt to professionalize us. Uh, do I remember exactly what else we studied? I don't. But we were put in bunks with campers. We were all spread out into different bunks with campers. And ironically, one of the campers in, those, in that bunk uh, ended up in the Chavarag years later and we became friends. We were peers at that point. I'll say who that was. I'm sorry? Who was that? Uh, her name is Adina Greenberg. <laughs> I don't know if you've run into that name. Um, her older sister, Shira Oliver Shalom, was married to John Ruskay. She passed away. They were in the Chavarat together, and Adina also came into the Chavarat. Uh, so it was a very encompassing, intense summer experience. And then I went back as a full counselor to Ramah in Connecticut. In Connecticut? In Connecticut. That was the so was first Ramah. Mm -hmm. And they sold Connecticut after my first year there. And then I was a counselor in Palmer, Massachusetts. So what year are we talking about? 64. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, I did not go back to Ramah. I got this very cool job in the city working for the Commission on Human Rights, which was in the mayor's office. And I investigated discrimination cases all summer. Remember that? I, I do, but I think that the, your last summer was 65, not 64. It was. You're right. It was 65. Because we met at the uh, yeah, Newport yeah. Folk Festival. Yeah, yeah, it was 60. She, she came down on the bus. Tell the story. Okay. First, first I'll tell you how I met him. Okay, so I have this intense Ramah background, and I'm a student in college in New York in the joint program between the seminary and Columbia. And one of the people in my program was going to have a party. Now, I say it was February. He says it wasn't, but... <coughs> I go to this party. I'm crashing this party. It's a party of people who went to Ramah in Nyack. My roommate, one of them, had gone to Nyack, so she was invited to the party, and I tagged along. And I get to this party in Brooklyn, and there's this guy on the other side of the room who is so good looking, my jaw dropped. <laughs> and I said to myself, I have to meet this guy. And then he went home with my roommate. <laughs> Why did you do that, Sam? <laughs> she was an English major. <laughs> and she was blonde and she was 5'6". Uh. <laughs> um, so that's how we actually met. Uh, then, as Zev rightly pointed out, in 1965, you get a day off from camp. So what did you do on your day off? You go, you go someplace. 
So one day off, we went to the Newport Folk Festival where Bob Dylan played. That's where he went electric, famous went night. Electric. Like the most famous night in the 60s. And he was there. I was there. So we basically spent the evening together. <laughs> um, and then he was back and forth to Israel, and I was in New York, and uh, um, I saw him right before he left. And I remember saying this to you, I don't know if you remember my saying it. I told him that altruism is the obverse of extreme egocentrism. Now, where did I get that from? I got that from Camus, <laughs> which I had been reading that spring semester, and it just rang true. So every one of my good friends that was going to Israel to fight in the war, this is what I told them in an attempt to get them to not go. Altruism is the obverse of, of extreme egocentrism. Mm -hmm. So, but you, no, I think you mean it's it's another form of it. No, uh, ob, it's the obverse. It's not the opposite. It's the obverse, huh? Right. Well, okay. Anyway, uh, but he went anyway, and then it was um, the fall of 1967 at Columbia, and the spring of 1968 at which point I was working in the dean's office at Columbia College, which was the epicenter of the student rebellion. So I would work during the day and I'd go sleep in the building at night. You with, would sleep in, oh. Yeah, as part of the demonstrators. So I was like doing both. And um, that ended in the spring of 68. And I was so disillusioned that I quit my job. Disillusioned with? With the administration, with the police, with, with the status quo, with organized everything. I was just totally disillusioned. Mm -hmm. And my boss was disillusioned. He quit his job. He was the dean of students of the college. He quit his job, I quit my job, and probably within 48 hours I was on a flight to Israel looking for him. I get to Israel, and guess what happened? Our planes crossed. I get to Israel, he's back in, in New York. But I found all his friends, so I had a great summer. So you stayed? I stayed, I stayed. And what were you doing there? Just having a good time, wandering around. Just getting New York, um, uh, Robert Kennedy's assassination out of my head, Martin Luther King's assassination out of my head, just really trying to distance myself from everything in New York. And America. And America. And then in the fall, I decided to go home because I really finally decided I couldn't make Aliyah. I couldn't live in Israel for the rest of my life because I didn't have family. Maybe if I had family there, I would have been more inclined to stay. But being there alone, were I just... You, were you feeling really caught up in all the exaltation and fervor of... Oh, the, absolutely, the absolutely. The it made you so proud to be Jewish. And then to be in Israel and to witness what had happened and, and the attitude of the people around you. It was, um, it was a very positive experience. Had you graduated college at that point? Uh, yeah, I graduated in 68. So you had just graduated? Yeah, 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 yeah. But graduation was like immaterial. Like there was, in the spring of 1968, nobody went to graduation right. as a small protest. Right, the, the strike had just yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Had you been involved in the civil rights movement and anti-war demonstrations uh, I was in the 60s? A little involved, not as involved as Ev was. Uh, I was a little involved. I went to some demonstrations. I was very involved in, in the student strike. That was very meaningful to me. How had you gotten involved? What, what had drawn you in there? Um, what they were fighting for what they were fighting against. Which was? Which was um, just the sense that the administration of the university was uncompromising and unwilling to acknowledge 
its role in the neighborhood that it was located in. It was, so partly uh, the, the uh, issues around Morningside Park. Yeah, yeah, that was a, a very big one. Uh, and the way um, there was no student representation on campus in, in any of the forums where uh, um, decisions were made. So, it, it, and, and a lot of people were feeling very alienated at that point. Uh, now, I started, as I said, in the joint program. And um, I, I stayed there for two years, and I, I felt that that was pretty limiting, too. And I wasn't too happy with the way the seminary uh, treated women. Um, but it was predating the women's movement, so there was nothing to really hang your hat on except to feel like you were um, extraneous. But I want to tell you something else, okay? When I was 13, I had a bat mitzvah, okay? And you prepare for a bat mitzvah so in this advance. This is in 1958. 1950, yeah, 1958. Mm -hmm. So I announced to the rabbi and the cantor that I wanted my haftorah to be uh, shirat devarah. My bat mitzvah, by the way, was Thanksgiving weekend. Shirat Devara is not the Haftarah for that Parsha. It's way later in the spring. But they said, okay. What I didn't know for years is that the reason they said, okay, was because it didn't count. Hmm. It didn't count. If I counted, I would have had to do the Haftorah for that Shabbat, right, for that portion. But it didn't count, so they let me do whatever I wanted. Were women having bat mitzvahs in yes. your Yes. In my synagogue, it was a, a regular phenomenon. There were so many baby boomers that every weekend, every Friday night, there was a bat mitzvah. Every Saturday morning, there was a, a bar mitzvah because there were so many kids. What, what did one do for a bat mitzvah in those days? Um, well, you read the Haftorah and you did parts of the service on Friday night, and you gave a speech. So and no Torah reading? No Torah reading, no. But, they did, but you did have to learn the truck for the Haftarah. But you did it without the brachas? No, we did it with the brachas. Oh. We did the whole thing. You didn't learn it from a, from a, a, um, a, a record? No, no. You learned the truck, and then you learned your Haftarah. Yeah. No, no, uh, no record, no tape, no nothing. I didn't even know those things existed. And the parts of the service that you did, uh, you also learned how to do it. But we had an, an, an unbelievable junior congregation. Um, so I really could lead services from start to finish by the time I was 13 years old. And did they let you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they let in, us... In junior congregation, they let you. In ju junior congregation. But did they let you do it for the main service for your... Uh, on Friday night, they did. Yeah. They did. Because it didn't count. First of all, what I didn't realize at the time was that actually the evening service on Friday night is right at sundown, just like it is every other night of the week. But this Friday night service was at 8.15 in the evening. So it didn't count either when so you stop and think. There was an earlier service. That of evening. course, there was an earlier service. So this was for the girls. But it was well, also, they had always, excuse me. I'm it sorry. was for the congregation yeah. because a lot of people couldn't get to a service at 5 30, 6 o'clock. So this was a way to encourage families to come to services on Friday night. There was a service. And there was an, always an Oleg Shabbat afterwards with a lot of Israeli dancing. You know, you, it, the service was at 8. How long is that service? Until 9? You didn't leave the synagogue until 10.30 or 11 at night yeah. on Would Friday your parents night. Go to this oh, as yeah. Well? Oh, yeah. So this was a family activity. Right, huh. right. How did you come to the realization that it didn't count and that's why they allowed you to do that part shot? So when did you? Actually realize, realize. Oh, and, and what made you realize? Um, I don't think I realized it until I was a, an adult living in New Jersey, and um, we picked my son's um, 
bar mitzvah date based on the Parsha, which was Breshit. And that's when it really hit me that it goes together with a particular date and there had to be only one reason in the world why they let me do that. And the only reason I came up with was it didn't count. What had you gone to Columbia to study? How had you decided on Columbia as a joint program? Because I wanted to do all things Jewish. That was my mentality. What did you, what were you studying at Columbia? Uh, well, I couldn't make up my mind at Columbia what to major in. So and you were I, at Columbia, not Barnard? At Columbia, not Barnard. Um, that's what the joint program was with. It was with Columbia, with uh, the School of General Studies at Columbia. So I just kept taking required courses and courses that I was interested in, and I kept changing my major every year. Um, and then finally, when I was a senior, I realized that I had to officially declare a major. So I counted up the number of credits I had in different disciplines, and I happened to have nine in history. And you needed 36 for a major, so I took them all in one year. Yeah. And so you majored in history. In history. Yeah. American history? Or what yeah, history? American, history. American history. And you did the joint program throughout? No, I only did the joint program for two years. Actually. And what was the, the, the position of, of women as students in the joint program at that point? Um, I can't say they were discriminated against. Um, First place, how many women were there relative to the, the I would students? say 40, 60. Okay. So a substantial number. A substantial number of women. And um, I just found my studies at Columbia to be more interesting and more meaningful, which is why I left the joint program and just stayed at Columbia. What was uninteresting to you or not compelling enough for you to stay in the, the program at JTS? Um, You'd come with such enthusiasm. Right, but academically, um, learning Gomorrah just didn't turn me on. It, you know, it was that simple. And the, the Hebrew literature courses, um, the Hebrew was very hard. It's very hard to read novels in Hebrew if you're not a native speaker. So it, it took so much effort to get through it. it. It just didn't seem like it was important enough. I can't think of another way to put it. Right. So when you graduated and went to Israel at that point, in yeah. 68, 68, Eight. Um, what were you thinking? Where, where were you in terms of what you were thinking in terms of my future? Your future? Um, and also your Jewish identity, those two. Um, my Jewish identity was strong. My Jewish observance was weak. I didn't go to show because that was boring and it didn't, I couldn't relate to it anymore. I come home to Albany for a vacation and I wouldn't go to show. I just hang out at home. What had happened? It had been so central. Just a few years uh, earlier. Um, well, what I now see is that I was reacting to what I now call top-down Judaism, which was not participatory. You were a voyeur, basically. And, and I got turned off, like a lot of people just got turned off. Contrast that with services at Ramah, let's say, that was very participatory, and there was nobody standing on the bima talking at you. So Ramah offered you a real alternative. That yeah. Was very engaging. That's right. And, That's right. And helped shift. It sounds shifted, sort of how you felt about what a what a service was. What, right. Right. Exactly. What uh, was it and being? what being observant meant. Um, but I wasn't observant at all until Zev and I got together and decided to get married in 1969. That's when things really changed. So when did you actually reconnect? You, you, you were in Israel, you had come back from Israel. Right, and then when I came back to the States. 
That, which was at the end of the summer? Which was after the summer. It was October 26th. And I decided to see if I could get home to Albany, New York in less than 24 hours. My birthday's October 27th. <coughs> so it, with no reservations, mind you. Uh, so I did it. It took four airlines. I got to Kennedy. I called my parents and I said, pick me up at the Albany airport. I'll be there in two hours. So my they didn't know you were coming. They didn't know I was coming. So my parents had a discussion while they were waiting for me. Uh, my mother was convinced that I was coming home because I was broke. And my father said, that's not the reason. If she needed money, she just would have let us know she needed money. That's not the reason. So I come home. I am in Albany for less than 24 hours. Uh, oh, on the way home from the airport in the car, my mother says to me, oh, your friend Zev called yesterday. So I get home and I pick up the phone and I call him back. And the next day I was on the bus and went back to New York where he was. Right? That's right. And uh, so you were in graduate school. Well, I was No, back. he was still well, an undergraduate. You were finishing your undergrad. Right. And what right. did you decide to do with that? Uh, and I had to get a job. I had been working in the dean's office at Columbia College. I had to get another job. So I got a job working for the Jewish chaplain on campus. Right? That was that job, the next job I had, right? I thought there was one a little bit before, but that's fine. Anyway, this is what's most yeah. important, the Jewish, what was yeah. it, A. Bruce Goldman? Yes, A. Bruce <coughs> Goldman, yeah. who was the Jewish chaplain on campus. And um, I started taking courses um, just for the heck of it, because they were free. And then eventually, after I guess a year or two, um, I got a job working in the dean's office at the School of General Studies. Mm -hmm. And I was a student advisor. And then I became the director of admissions at the School of General Studies. Um, I was 23, right? Yeah, I was pretty young. Um, and then we got married in 1970. So I'm the Dean of Admissions and I'm looking out my window. I don't know if you've ever been to a Columbia campus. It's th these old buildings with windows that are practically a story high. And um, it's late at night and the campus is dark and I'm looking out my window to see who else is working in their offices. Because you could see in the different buildings which lights were on. And I, I, and I, I realized that I was the only person of my rank in the university who didn't have a PhD. So I needed to get one of those. So I went and saw my old art history professor and I said to him, I think I want to get a PhD in art history. What do you think of that idea? So he said, it's a great idea. Take the summer and, and, and learn French and German so you can pass the comprehensives and then we can admit you. So I went home and I thought about whether I could possibly learn French or German, concluded that that really was a bad idea. And then I thought about, well, what do I like about my job? And what I really liked about my job was the student advising part of it. So I decided, okay, I'll get a degree in psychology. So I presented myself. I had never taken an undergraduate course in psychology. But they let me take a couple of graduate courses as a, you know, as a, a special student. And then they, after that, they admitted me. So I worked and I went to school. And um, eventually I quit my job so I could do an internship. And then I got a degree in psychology. And have been a psychologist. Right, so, right. So. I also had fantasies of being the first lady president of Columbia, I must confess. And you definitely needed a PhD for that. <laughs> but once I got into um, uh, uh, 
uh, graduate school and really into psychology, I realized that I didn't want to work for the university anymore. So it was a good choice for you? It was a very good choice. So let's um, turn to the New York Cobra. So we got married. Started. We got exactly. married. I wanted to get married on March 7th, which was Purim. And Zev said, don't make a joke of this. We can't get married on Purim. So we got married on March 15th, the Ides of March, instead. Um, no, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. We got married on the Ides of March was the 15th. Purim was the next Saturday night, next Sunday night, actually. And so we got married. We went to um, uh, Cape Cod for our honeymoon, which was like four days long. And then we came back to New York, and the very first thing we did was go to the Chavarah for Purim. So what do you know about um, the, the beginnings of the Chavarah? The Chavarah was new, new-ish. It was just a few months old right. at that point. It had started right. the previous fall. Right, 1969. And you certainly, I, Zev, you <clears throat> knew people who were involved in, in, yeah. the, in the initial founding. So did Leslie, but we both knew people. I had gone there to the Havara a little bit beforehand. Um, John Roske, uh, Peter Geffen were friends of mine from before. And, um, How did you know them? I knew Peter from USY. Right. Uh, he was a, a big guy, Met Metney, that was the re And then he was president of USY, national president. And he was a friend of mine from USY, and I, we kept in touch. And we also took uh, courses at the seminary together in the School of Informal Education is what it was. Um, and um, anyway, I went to a service was the first time. Um, and uh, they were sitting in a circle on the floor. Uh, and um, uh, they were uh, doing just a few of the prayers that they wanted to do. And one guy was a poet and he read some poems. Um, and uh, then uh, that was the service. And um, I wasn't there with John. John had told me about it, I think. Uh, Murray Pomerantz was the kid who, who was reading this, the poems. Um, and um, then I think I'd been to some other occasion too. There were a few people I had known. Um, but um, when we got married, uh, I wanted, we wanted to check out synagogues. Um, there was a synagogue across the street, which was this old Orthodox school, which was really, you know, dying. Uh, but I did go there for an aliyah one time, and they actually snored. It was like the first time I'd heard about it, but they never, I had never done it before. But got the aliyah, they gave a mission bearer, and then they paused. Fortunately, I had remembered from some short story, I think that's when you're supposed to say, how much money you're giving, <laughs> right? So I said, uh, Anyway, that wasn't for us, right? That became, that's Ramat Ora, which became, uh, now it's a real hit place, a lot of people go there. It's on 110th Street. Uh, so um, we went there to the Chavara, it was already, you know, like we were interested I knew, uh, Peter came up and congratulated me right away, congratulated us right away for getting married. Well, we walked yeah. into the room. Right, there were a lot of people waiting there. This was the, now you're right at yeah, We have to explain, the Hebra rented an apartment in the Upper West Side. That was our dues, basically, was to pay the rent. So this was the 99th Street? Uh, 98th Street. 98th Street. Yes, that's right. So that's what we said, we went into the Hebra, it was that apartment building. And it was for him. So ahead. we walk in, and all these people I know from Ramah are there. Right. And then all these people I know from USY, uh, and a couple of people who were in college with me. So it felt like we came home. Yeah. It's the best way to describe it. We came home. And what, what happened that night? What Can you describe what happened for during that forum celebration? Um... I remember Phyllis announced that she was pregnant. Right, that Phyllis. was the major. Phyllis Sperling announced that she was pregnant. Um, that was like the major event, because <laughs> I knew Phyllis when we were yeah. kids in camp. Uh, uh, when, I was a, when I was a counselor, she was the um, Amanut counselor, arts and crafts. She's an architect by training. The kitchen you were in was designed by her and her second husband. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the kitchen you were in. As well as our basement and yeah. our attic. <laughs> yes. Okay, so, and it was a very um, fun Purim, you know? It just, it felt right. 
Can you sort of describe at all what felt right about it? Everybody was participating. Everybody knew everything. It wasn't this um, uh, voyeuristic experience. You know, when you're a little kid and it's Purim uh, or Simchas Torah and you're running around wild because that's what kids are allowed to do, that's one thing, they have a lot of fun. But once you get old enough to not be able to do that, it's a big bore, at least it is for me. Uh, Purim in a regular synagogue, to me, is just noise. Okay, but this wasn't just noise. This was very participatory um, and, and fun. I can't think of another word to describe it. And it was the informal quality, I think, that made it so much but fun. It's also the, if I just might add, yeah. it was the fun, the informal, but also the educated uh, qual aspect yeah, of that it. Everybody it, knew everything. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, and that's one of the, things that I think made it work was that we all had a certain level of knowledge that we didn't need somebody to tell us what to do. And um, so sometimes we didn't want somebody to tell us what to do, uh, but we all had a, a high level of Jewish knowledge. And so we could be creative with it. The Purim things were fun later on because we would do like new interpretations of the Megillah. Uh, we would do a Purim spiel, we'd really go into, you know, what is this story about? Uh, we had some uh, real um, high power academics in the New York Havara, uh, who, who would know, like, you know, what, when was the Megillah written? <laughs> you know? yeah. And what, what's this all about? So these kinds of bringing to bear a lot of the academic issues that we were getting in college onto, this, onto our Judaism, and that's sort of following through in what the conservative movement is all about, you see. So in some ways, the, the, I think the Havara movement, at least ours, did come out of the conservative movement because U.S. Y. and Ramah, these are two conservative programs. Uh, we did have some kids who were many orthodox, of the, but, Sorry. Know, yeah. Sorry Good. for interrupting you. Many of the early members were rabbinical students at the seminary. Or, yeah. or, or former. Or, for, or uh, they left, I mean, yeah. the, the political issue, you'll probably get better when you talk to uh, John uh, and Peter. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, there was a big issue with the seminary, but they dropped out of the seminary uh, as rabbinical students uh, for reasons we shouldn't go into, because you'll get it from them better. Uh, but the fact is that it is one of the impetuses. And the official name of the Chavarah was the Chavarah Community Seminary, and it was a registered seminary in the state of New York that would give draft deferments. Right. When you, when you got involved, it was still um, registered as a seminary? Yes. Was, yes. Yes, I don't know. The problem, maybe that's um, since, uh, you know, a fall, <laughs> fall, by the way. But I remember uh, uh, Peter, Peter did it. Mm. Uh, he said, you know, and, he, you know, and I think it was an actual document. I don't know if it was, maybe it was used for Burton Weiss to get a deferment. I'm not sure. But, uh, but we also uh, really did take the idea of, of um, learning seriously. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do, participatory, wasn't only in services, but also we all had knowledge that we wanted to share. And so programs on retreats, sometimes, you know, people would do the Divrei Torah, Divrei Torah, and um, they would share that. The idea was that everybody has something to contribute. Now, the, some of these people were really good, strong academics, but other people were not. They had, like, um, one was a dance therapist who would do stuff like that. That didn't really last. I'm thinking of Josh's first wife. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and Lynn, who who was into hearing impaired, yes, and she would do sign language but services. But she was a rabbi. But she was a rabbi. Right, right. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Yeah. This comes on later. She was later, I think. She joined later, but yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you were you aware of um, the the early discussions, or did you have any role in the early discussions about actually forming the Chavara? In the, in the pre-period, before it was actually no. sort of got off the ground. When we, get there, when we got there, it was already, um, the, the, uh, the nucleus was there. We were like the, uh, the Madisons, not the uh, Hamiltons. Uh, <laughs> or I don't know, I don't know wrong analogy. The second generation. <laughs> well, not quite. Not That's quite. just it, you know. Not quite. We're, we're part of the founding generation, but we're, we're on the cusp. A cusp, yes. We're on the cusp. cusp. <laughs> At the point that you got involved, uh -huh. was there any uh, kind of formal or even informal admissions process? We yeah, spent a lot of time talking about that. We spent a lot of time. One of the things, I think you asked in the forum, what did we, you know, what was a big problem? One of our big problems was what do we do? <laughs> so we would meet every Thursday night and that, you know, that we'd have trouble with the program. If we, if once a month we'd have Friday night meals and that was easy because we have Shabbos, we'd make, we'd do Marv, then we'd have, you know, we'd sing and that was beautiful. And we'd eat, we knew we had the program. 
a uh, few times a year we would go on retreats. Once a month we had a retreat. In yeah, in our, in our really a great yeah. years, once a month we went on retreats. And there the programming is, but we wanted to meet every Thursday night too. And sometimes, so often we would talk about ourselves. <laughs> and one of the things we talked about was admissions, you know. Can we do, how, how do we have criteria? Uh, should be a secret? Um, uh, should we recruit people? Should people come in? Oh, it was really uh, every possible concept we'd, uh, we would go into. When we formally joined, we were interviewed. And that process of interviewing people continued. Because they wanted, uh, mm -hmm. member, who, who interviewed us? Alan Mintz interviewed me. I don't remember. Say it again. Alan, Alan, Alan Mintz. Mintz. He was one of the early members. Were yeah. You, were you interviewed separately or together? I don't oh, remember. separately. I remember I was interviewed separately. Then I must have been interviewed separately. <laughs> no, no, because he, he, he asked me about you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, what did he <laughs> ask you? <laughs> I'm afraid to ask what he asked you. Uh, this is this is Lashon Hara. What did he say? It's not really Lashon Hara, but um, he said, uh, "I understand you. You know, you want to be in. Okay, you know about. Uh, but what, we're, I'm into, what about Leslie? Is she why, is she interested in this?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "Of course she is." That, that's basically it, you know. But um, see, the, the question is, you know, what are are we a group of snobs, you know, or are we open to everybody? Because the great movement, the great idea is is democracy, right, and being inclusive. Uh, but 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 a lot of the fun is 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 knowing the, knowing the Judaism well enough to really um, have somebody who can interact on a, a fun level. So there's a, in fact. Uh, when part of the movement came about with, with like davening, they, they would um, have uh, West Side Minion was like open to everybody, but there were some people who wanted to be called Minyan Ma'at, which would be people who really knew the prayers and, and uh, could really participate and but sing that nicely. Was later. I know, but, but, the, Much but, later. but the philosophy is the same, you see. Uh, on membership, it's the same idea. Should we be open to anybody who wants to join? Or should we be very selective and find out somebody who's really like-minded, basically of the conservative, uh, you know, Ramah, USY, LTF, so this, a little Zionism? In a, <laughs> in a nutshell, we wanted to make sure that people were at the right address. That, that was the, the phrase we used. That was the phrase we used. <laughs> and what that meant was that people who shared the same level of observance, the same uh, knowledge, more or less, of Judaica and the same commitment that we had. Or searching for the right commitment. Or even, yeah, but. Was another way we defined ourselves was as searchers, seekers. Seekers. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. Trying to, we all love Judaism. We're trying to figure out the way to, to express that. So ultimately, because this was one of the critiques that was leveled at the early Chabar wrote, this so-called elitism of yeah. the right. uh, yeah. missions process that, or the, the attitude towards who was in and who was out that was yes. embodied in the admissions process. What I would say to that is that if you want a, a structure that's hierarchical with the people with knowledge on top and everybody else uh, participating but really observing, that's a traditional synagogue. And what this was, was that everybody was equal in their ability to participate to the degree in which they chose to. So I don't think of it as being elitist. It was, um, it was a careful selection process to make sure that um, nobody would ever feel like a second-class citizen. My word's not theirs. That, um, it would it be fair to say it was um, a matching process you were looking at. Perfect. Uh, mm. That's the same same idea as mm. the right address. It was a matching process. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So were there ever any sort of articulated criteria or was it more the sense of the people who were doing the interviews and the group? Was there, was there a time and how did it work? Someone interviewed you and but then how was the decision and then made? we And then we interviewed people and we would go back to the group and say, I met this person, and I really think this person would be a good fit with our group, for instance, right? Yeah, I was always for being as inclusive as possible. What about the people who most, didn't feel as 
you know, I don't think we, well, I, I was for, we, I remember who we, I mean, it's funny who we interviewed. You remember, we interviewed Paula Hyman, right? So, I mean, like, what were we going to say? She doesn't belong with us. You know, and who were we to do it? But yeah. there were one or two people who we did not want to be part of the group. And based on what, though? Uh, gross personality defects. Which was another catchphrase of ours. Yeah. This was way before I went to graduate school. Um, but yeah, gross personality defects. You, People you didn't feel like a personality. Fit. Yeah, yeah. It was. I, I mean, it was complicated because you know uh, a lot of uh, people like us can be pretty obnoxious. <laughs> And there were people who, who we could say to ourselves, uh, who were members of the group, I don't particularly like that person, but they still belong in the group. They're not going to be my new best friend, right? but they still belong. And there, were, a there, couple, were, there, there were people like but that. But there were times when, when something was, someone was considered to be so divisive, not just obnoxious, but, but divisive. Uh, a pernicious element because of her or his personality right. uh, that we really felt they shouldn't be. And I can, I don't want to name names for this, but there, there are examples, there is one example I can think of, but mm -hmm. I won't mention it. Uh, but basically, I think we were accused of being elitists, and I think that, uh, I, well, I think we're trying to get around it, but it's, um, it's complicated. In terms of, uh, admissions, as, if it was conceived originally as a seminary, as Chavarot Shalom uh -huh. was in Boston, what that translated to in Boston was that the members in the early years, the very early years, were men, exclusively men. Oh, I see. Because oh. it was a seminary. Oh, no. This was, this was pre, I mean, Sally Presand wasn't uh, That's right. ordained until 1972. Right. right. So 1968, this was, as Art Green said, a pre-feminist moment. Yeah. People weren't we had the naming for that child I spoke of before, the woman who was pregnant, Phyllis. Phil Sperling. Yeah, Phyllis Sperling. When her daughter was born, we had a minion at the Hubble apartment without her. Without the baby, but without her either. And I remember it. David Sperling was there. I was there. Uh, Martha Acklesberg was there. And, uh, oh, the guy, the, a few others. I guess we had an actual minion, and then we did actually learning in name in the name of uh, Sharon, uh, Schiffer, I think is her Hebrew name. I still remember yeah. Schiffer Sperling, uh, just like you would have an Orthodox naming. You see, we did we did a shear in her but, honor, and then we did a Ramana God. She was not there, but I think we counted Martha in the minion. That's that's the point I'm trying so to make. So was Martha? <laughs> so what was the policy towards admitting women? Or not, or it, was, not. it was completely equal. Yeah. Women were admitted. Women yeah. were admitted. Yeah. It wasn't a question. So why wasn't Phyllis? I, I'm, I'm just showing you the mentality, you know? Uh, was uh, it that Phyllis, well, Phyllis it, and David both came from Borough Park. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the naming was a quote-unquote orthodox minion because of that. But I think we counted Martha. Uh, I don't remember. But I know by the time the were next, you there? Were you I don't there? remember if I was you there. You were not there. By the time the next baby was born, who was Ilana, um, she became Ilana Ruskay, uh, that was a much more egalitarian naming. And everybody was there, including the baby, including her mother. Right. And that was a year and a half later yeah. when Ilana yeah, was born? Yeah, I remember born. that one. Yeah, I remember them all. Yeah. I think John Ruskay was also at the naming. You can ask him. <laughs> So I mean, I just think it's significant, yeah. So basically what you're saying, just to recap, is that women and men were, became members equally, essentially. Equally, that, oh, right, yeah. right. And women applied to become members. Yes, yes. Okay. Very interesting. And some members were single women. I mean, I came attached, but Liz Colton, for example, right. was a full member and she was a single woman. Right. And there were, there were other women you back see, then. Yeah, this is a whole aspect that, you know, we haven't talked about yet, but... Uh, uh, I mean, a single woman joining a congregation was kind of a big deal, uh, and even a single man uh, under 30. I mean, what are you joining a congregation for? Uh, and that was one, and there was this void in Judaism for what do you do between uh, the time, you know, <coughs> graduation of college and when you have the, uh, and, and you have kids, what do you, what are you going to do in the synagogue? What do you need the synagogue for? Or at for? least got married. It, yeah. Right, yeah. right. Uh, so, right. Uh, uh, for some women, I think they, they saw that as they saw it that way. And of course, there was the feminism. But the feminism, in an explicit way, came about about a few years later.
we're back from lunch, and uh, we had left off talking about the admissions process, essentially, at the New York Hover Rock. So I want to turn now to talking about some particular aspects of um, life within the Hover Rock and sort of delve into them a little bit more deeply. So I want to start with uh, the, uh, the very idea of community and the vision for community that uh, the Hover Rock uh, put forward. Can, in the brochure uh, for the Havara, this is what was said about it. These young people see themselves as Jews, but they are seeking to clarify and deepen beyond current formulations the meaning of being Jewish in the 20th century, in 20th century America. They are seeking to address the wisdom and challenge of Jewish tradition to their own lives and to the problems of the society they live in. What brochure? The New York Havara brochure. That's the one we joked about, right? Did we ever come out with it? I didn't know that. There was one guy. Evidently. One guy wanted to do a brochure. We thought it was so funny. Uh, he was into PR at the time. Alan Sugarman, he was the guy. Well, who'd you get this brochure from? It's you don't know. In various, various. Uh, and that's probably where they got it from. Yeah. So you never physically I saw never a copy of it. it. Well, now I'm cool. really curious. Yeah, we'll have to find out where, where exactly it came from. What's the story that you know of? The Alan Sugarman one time said we need a brochure, and we said, you see, in some ways we were very interested in not being self-conscious and not seeing ourselves as some cutting edge thing. So we didn't want to have a brochure that would explain us. Uh, we, we, we wanted to keep it fluid. We didn't want to become a cliche. Uh, and that, that touches all the bases, and it's really uh, almost, I'm sure really, almost embarrassing the way it touches all the bases, but uh, it, it just doesn't ca get it at all. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a brochure, it's a PR brochure. So it doesn't, it doesn't capture. <laughs> no. How could it? <laughs> read it again, I mean, you can't argue with anything, but read it, go ahead, it'll be fun. Does it say anything? Uh, I'll read it uh, one more time. Yeah. And then you tell me what you think. I'll say jargon, cliche, we'll call it out. <laughs> Good, but then the question is, was what, what are they trying to get to? Was there, what, what were they trying to get to? So here's what it says. Yeah. These young people see themselves as Jews, but they are seeking to clarify and deepen beyond current formulations the meaning of being Jewish in 20th century America. I agree. That's what we're trying to do. No problem. I yep. agree with it, except I don't think that could have been written by a member of the Havara. Because a member of the Havara would never have said um, the first... Beyond current formulations. No, 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 the beginning. These young people. These see young people. Somebody who is a member of the Chavara would have said, "We see ourselves." That's why I, I'm a little suspicious as to where that came from. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I think you ought to check out the source. <laughs> I mean, it's right, but it's it's not. We want it to be authentic, you see. And 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 once you become, uh, once you think of PR, this is this this is, what, I guess, the essence of the counterculture. You know, not trying to. To be authentic, to be yourself, and not to be television jargon. And that's what that is. You know, this is like a, if it were. That, that's what you'd use in a in a, in a, a, Nova, a PBS special, right? A, a front line. Who's going? That's the jar, exactly the the bullshit jargon that we were against. That was the inauthentic thing. That was why uh, the uh, underclass was so appealing in some ways because they, they there was this there's this myth, of course, that suburban people have that you know the underclass they're more authentic and they, so their language is more authentic. Another uh, question it seems to me is how would in these very early this very early period of the Havara, how would the New York Havara even envision using a brochure? They, for, for what? That's why we yeah. thought it was so funny. I mean, you well, know, that's so why it was funny that he said, "Let's do a brochure." But on want. the other hand, it had no utility. No utility. Oh. At least do you I think don't there think was so. A shared vision? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I think there was a shared vision of a of a Jewish community, and I think that the word community <coughs> has to be stressed. Um, in fact, my parents referred to the New York Havara as my f other family. Because they felt the connections were as strong between the members of the Chavara as they are in a family. Yeah. Uh, what I was saying is uh, um, that the Chavara gave people a strong sense of community. Um, and particularly, I think, in larger cities, 
like Boston, like New York, even Philadelphia, uh, you need a tight-knit community um, in order to, in my case, to function, to feel comfortable with the people around you, to feel comfortable inside. And the Kavara also gave us a way to express being Jewish um, in a way that um, countered the alienation that I know I felt in a traditional synagogue, and I'm pretty sure most other people felt that way too, who were in the Chavara. Your comments made me think of the idea of feeling at home in a community, and I'm wondering what, how important you feel the, the actual apartment was in the creation of community for the Chavara. Uh, it was a central location where um, there were activities going on a lot of the time. We usually had a bedroom rented out to a member. Yeah, so, Terry yeah, there. yeah. So that, that uh, um, supplemented the cost of the apartment, of running the, the apartment. And um, uh, when, when groups meet in different people's houses, and I know some minions do that. I think it, it conveys a very transient quality to the group, to the mentality of the group. But if you have a, a place, a locus, I think it gives it more permanence and more stability. The apartment was paid for through essentially dues yeah. to the minion. Yeah. So it also gave people a financial stake and commitment in... in and maintaining it. I don't know that that was consciously part of anybody's thought process, frankly. We were all young. We didn't think about stuff like that. And rents were cheaper, too. And rents were a lot cheaper. <laughs> I mean, I mean, how much that would go for now? <laughs> I, mean, I, can't, I can't even remember what we paid in dues. But $60. That's what we paid? Yeah. Um, all the members, you divided up the annual rent, and I think it came to $60 a person. I think that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pretty good. It's like a, it was a clubhouse, you know. On one level, it was also a clubhouse. So the clubhouse was used, this house was used right. for uh, classes, for the weekly communal meal on Thursday evenings, right. followed by a program of some or kind. A or a meeting. Or a meeting. Um, and for services when services were held, which was right. every week. Yeah, right? but Friday night and, and Shabbat a lot of times. And then after a while, the, some, the, the uh, Shabbat morning thing moved over to the West Side Minion and Minyan Ma'at, but that's much later. Different. That was much quite, well. quite a bit later. Quite yeah. a bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. much right. later. So um, the New York Chavara has been described um, by some as the Chavara with, quote, the really good food. Uh, <laughs> right. That looks like it right. Rings, rings, rings right. What, what role do you think the weekly meals had in sort of this? Well, what do meals community? do for people? Meals bring people together. Meals allow people to share ideas, uh, and that's what those meals did, whether it was on the Thursday night or a, a, a Shabbat meal or a meal at a retreat. And uh, we did take those meals very seriously in terms of how they were planned and, and, you know, and what the menus were. How did that get uh, decided? What do you mean you took it seriously? Um, we would talk to one another about what we were going to make. Uh, a lot of places have, like we're going, we're going tonight to a potluck dinner at our very small synagogue, which is very much like a chavara, okay? Uh, so their idea of a potluck dinner is bring whatever you want. It's not the way we operated in the chavara. <laughs> much more controlling. We were more controlling. We were we much the, more the freedom controlled. Guys, right? Much more controlled. You had to have a starch. You had to have a vegetable. You had to have some kind of protein. You had to have dessert. Everybody couldn't bring pasta. Yeah. How did that get decided? And some wannabe professor of any field would uh, do one of the dishes because he or she was slumming it and really wanted to take food seriously. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of uh, would-be gourmets right, at that right. time. So had, but we would somebody would be, or two people would be in charge of the food for a retreat. Right, right. And those people would make up a menu and then make phone calls and say, you're making salad, you're bringing a green vegetable, you're doing dessert, you're bringing wine or paper goods. And were the meals at the Chavura, um they were kosher? Yeah. 
Were, were, was meat served? Or yes. Were they, it yes. Was. But there was always um, a vegetarian option. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. Yes. We, we catered to the highest level of observance. Okay? So um, if we were having a meat meal, let's say, uh, it was absolutely understood that there would be no dairy products, that only meat dishes would be used, meat pots, etc., etc. But people could cook in their own homes. Yeah, we could cook. Because um, the people who cooked uh, were people who kept kosher. So that uh, was understood also. That was also understood. And the people who didn't keep kosher would buy wine or buy challah or whatever. Sometimes, if I may, it became an interesting problem. I can think of two cases uh, where, because it's a broader question about the, the most extreme uh, form of observance. Um, so with retreats, what happened? Does the food have to arrive before Shabbat? Right, that was a big issue. It was a big issue, and <laughs> the resolution was it did have to arrive before Shabbat. So that everybody would be comfortable. So every right, exactly. But more interesting was when I just remember we spent a lot of time on it. We would go to retreat centers. You know, they're often winterized summer, okay, summer camps, but one of them had a fireplace. Now, can you stalk the fire on Shabbat? Of course, you can't. But I'm doing it. What, what do you care? You keep shot, but I'm doing it. I, I don't buy, but you're getting Hana'a. I think that was sort of Hana'a. Yeah, you're getting pleasure from my breaking Shabbos, my fellow Jew breaking Shabbos, stalking the fire. Right. So there was so, no uh, Shabbos Goy. If there had been a Shabbos Goy, it would have been. It would have been fine. Um, right. It would have been fine it, with it, the Shabbos yeah, Goy. Yeah, but the, the problem, I mean, this was, this was a, a big issue. We really talked about this a long time. I remember, you know. Um, and, and, uh, we, we, and, what was, and what's interesting is, what was considered legitimate uh, evidence to bring into the conversation. So in one way, it was a kind of traditional halakhic discussion. But then there was also the way I feel. I don't feel comfortable. Now, all that jargon is from, from another world, right? right that's so from the 60s. We were blending those things, right? And, and your particular problem with my uh, doing the, uh, my, for example, my uh, stalking the fire, it, it may not be your problem for halakhic reasons, but you, uh, don't like to see a fellow Jew break Shabbos, you see. Um, so it, there's a different, a different sense of what's admissible evidence in a conversation, what, what, what you can talk about, and what, what's legitimate to bring to the conversation. Sit back. Um, does, that, does that mean that in most instances the, the observance was actually much more on the, on the observant end, on the, on the more from end, because because from somebody is the could wrong, be, quote, uncomfortable. From, from is the wrong word, okay. I think. Okay. I think, uh, I think it's a question of observance, which is different than the mentality of frumkite. I mean, I see it as uh, a difference. Yeah, right, okay. There are many, 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 and were many Jews who belong to conservative synagogues whose observance was uh, high, shall we say. They were Shomer Shabbat, they kept kosher inside and outside. So that's a level of observance. That's not philosophical, and that's not frumkite, at least not in my mind. Mm -hmm. So how does that so of the interface way it, with this issue? So with this kind of an issue, first of all, these decisions were never made by majority. They were only made by consensus. Which meant Talk that about it some of these discussions <laughs> went on forever. Right, right. But when there was finally a resolution, everybody was comfortable with the decision. Were there? Could you always get to a resolution? Yeah, if you take a long time. I mean, that's, that was the 60s. You know, in the 70s when uh, people had the time to sit around and, and just keep discussing something. Yeah. Um, so besides the meals, these weekly meals, obviously right. the community meetings, communal meetings, weekly meetings or, um, or programs right. were a regular part of yes. Mm -hmm. yes. communal life, so to speak. Um, what other kinds of issues can you remember being discussed at, at the meetings? Part one. And part two of that question is, did most of these discussions take place actually within the context of, of a meeting or were 
did it also sort of continue to play itself out, these discussions and just informal conversation that was happening? I would say, I would say, I don't know if Sev would agree with this, but I would say that the majority of them took place within the context of a meeting. So, there, kashru, so this kind of Shabbos observance and, and kashrut related kashrut questions, that was one kind of issue. Right. There are other kinds of issues that sort of took a lot of talking and feeling your way through it. Mm -hmm. What kind of services we were going to have? I remember uh, long discussions about Rosh Hashanah services, um, whether we were including absolutely everything, uh, every uh, you know psalm that's in the, in the machzor, or are we going to pick and choose? Um, do you remember those discussions? I remember the first time we decided to do Yom Kippur ourselves. That was we were into it a yeah. few years, and we uh, we did have pe enough people who had the skills. But this seemed to be a, a major step. I remember talking with Ruthie Hundred about it. Like this was, this was somehow this was like a major step. First of all, it meant we weren't going home for Yom Kippur. But second of all, it meant that we were actually going to do it ourselves. This is like the real thing, right? We were going to do our own kol nidre. A big um, deal, right? It was a big right. deal. I think it was, yeah. Um, and what was the discussion? Whether to do it or not? Uh, what who, to do? Who's going to do it? Uh, what to do? There were also issues. Um, sometimes with uh, the actual words of the tefillah. Um, this is before tefillot were gender neutral, shall we say. Mm -hmm. It was all male. Okay. So we we'll talk actually, about yeah, that too. I, actually do want to come back I was going to get to that, but there were other issues. Uh, should you pray that the temple be rebuilt, for example? Uh, these are you know, regular theological discussions. But we would, we felt that they were okay to talk about. Musaf uh, was that an issue? What? Musaf was the, the Musaf, uh, yeah, Musaf was an issue. Often though, but you know, we were we were we were also honest. Sometimes Musaf's an issue because enough already, you know. <laughs> right. But uh, there is a theological. I, mean, I go to Roma Mu, for example, uh, in Upper West Side. That's really nice service, uh, and um, it was like grand grandchildren of the Chavara. But um, uh, they they don't even. They, they don't even talk about Musaf. It's, they make their own procedure. It's not even there. You know? right. uh, yeah. So, uh, the, the, yes, the gender gender issues is the whole thing. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other sort of major thematic issues that would come up? That yes. Come what up? we're going to do with our lives. Uh, there were discussions like that. Um, th this was not necessarily not Jewish based, but here we were. You know, in our. 20s, uh, most of us in graduate school or some kind of postgraduate training. What in the want? beginning, yeah. I was the only person who actually had a job. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the first I, time I, we ever used a credit I had card. A, I had a job, <laughs> I had a credit card, I had hours, I had to be at work. Nobody else had that in the beginning. We didn't know what it was like. <laughs> and nobody had children. And no, nobody until, until Sharon Sperling was born nine months later. That was the first child. And still the mentality was not that we had kids. The mentality was that we didn't yet have kids. Most of us weren't married, uh, which is another issue. You know, I was just thinking, like, um, when we talk about other people's religious observance, did it ever occur to us that, that um, a boyfriend and girlfriend who weren't married were sleeping together on a retreat? Was that ever a question? No. It was you know, never so, a question. So even from the beginning, it, it there was, was already that liberal attitude towards sex, right? right. Sexual revolution was happening. Right. Yeah, but well, this it, is 1970. It, we're it still, happened already. We, no, but we had, when we were, before we were married, when I slept at your house, we did not sleep in the same bed, and the same when we slept in my house. And I assume that for every single person in that group, when they went home to their parents, nobody slept together. I know, that's the point I'm making. I mean, yeah, but but any, I mean other, any other synagogue, they would have, right, any other synagogue retreat. So, in other words, the sexual revolution came into it almost automatically. It, didn't, it wasn't even a question. Right. I'm not talking yeah, about the feminist issue. Just recently widely available. The pill. Yeah, it well, was just out. In the 60s, it was widely available. Birth control is 63. Yeah. yeah. And this yeah. is 71, so. Oh, well, late well, 60s. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yes, the sexual revolution, it already it was like assumed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big deal. Socially, that's a big deal. Did people, um, in addition to the meals that took place um, at the Chavara itself in the, in the apartment, was it a community in the sense that people also invited each other to, to their homes? Yes. Absolutely. We used to have a giant New Year's Eve party every year. 
yeah. in our apartment. And uh, Friday night dinners, most of the time you invited other people if you were making dinner, and they were more often than not members of the Chavara. Or in that Upper West Side Jewish circle. Because yeah. they were our friends. They were. That's a social group. Yeah. And did, were there some people who were more the inviters and some people who were more the invitees? Or? Yeah, of yeah. course. Of course, because some people like to cook and some people like just to eat. And mostly single guys, you know. And they, they, they would not usually cook for others. Some did. We had one, one Chavara guy had married a couple of couple rod down the, down the hall. So he would use their kitchen so he could kind of fix up nice stuff because they didn't like to cook. <laughs> so and that was, you know, they were all in the couple rod. Yeah. Um, okay, so we, in, so we've talked a little bit about retreats. Um, can you describe somewhat um, more, in, more fully the, the atmosphere of these retreats and what was what was different about what happened during the retreats from what was just happening on a on a week to week basis in the Havara apartment well you were together for 48 hours okay for starters that's a much more intense environment um, you're not going home per se at the end of a meeting um, you're staying up and schmoozing and eventually just going into a room and going to sleep and then the next morning getting up and there's your group again. So the continuity, um, I would imagine that's what it's like on a kibbutz. That continuity, you leave, you go to sleep, but then you come back, you eat communally, uh, all your activities are communal. Mm -hmm. Was there a difference in the kind of services that took place or religious observance that took place? It was the same. It could be more leisurely. I remember Friday night, mm -hmm. we would do, uh, um, what's the opening hymn that we do on Friday night? Well, the Kabbalah Shabbat. Yeah. Lachadodi. No, no, no. It's the very beginning. Lachun Aralana. No, no. Steve Asher used to do it all the time. It was so beautiful. I remember his funeral. Uh, this is a how we used to sing it. Uh, anyway. A, 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 Anyway, it would be slow, you know, and it, like the whole week would fall over off our shoulders. Sometimes we would sing it as long as we wanted, you know, over and over. It was quite beautiful. Um, and uh, also sports, that's a part of the uh, thing too, you know, like uh, we'd, uh, somebody would bring football and we'd uh, play touch football a lot. Um, and uh, volleyball, we played volleyball. Yeah. Uh, go for long nature walks. Um, the, it was also the lack of structure. Um, uh, you know, some pe uh, people would uh, you could hang out, do things as you want, uh, make conversation, go off and talk to people you hadn't talked to in a while. Very much like camp. That was the kind of an, uh, um, environment it felt like to me. It was very much like being at Ramah. Do you think that was a general perception that many people came with Ramah backgrounds and this was an opportunity to recreate that sort of in the round then? I would imagine that it was, but it wasn't conscious. It was, you know, a state of being that people were individually comfortable with, and so they brought that state of being into this group simultaneously. In some of our conversations with people at Chavarat Shalom, there was some conversation about consciously not recreating some pieces of uh, people's prior experiences that were rooted in camp, particularly Ramah, like oh. pounding on the table during beer cut, you oh. know, those kinds of camp experiences. Does that sort of ring a bell at all? No, not at all. Absolutely. Does it ring a bell with you? I didn't have a Ramah experience. I, I, I just, well, I was a counselor once, but I, I didn't, uh, I didn't speak to that. Uh, of course, I had friends who went there. but. Uh, I think if what those people mean is that it, they didn't want to give the impression that they were uh, behaving like uh, like you know kids in camp, uh, but there's that community that communal feeling that, that isn't necessarily for children. Grown-ups can have it too, so maybe the, the point of the outward manifestation. Not, not, yeah, not, not I don't. Yeah. I don't remember okay. any discussion no. like that. I also don't remember a lot of table banging. No. I remember okay. we were doing nigunim sometimes, you know, sing, but, uh, and also I remember Adina particularly, but a few others would, would dance, you know? 
They were just at the table, right? And we would do a lot of zmirot and yeah. wine. Oh, yes. Yeah, we did drink a lot of wine. Uh, In the days before we knew what good was. Yeah, Chablis Amadon. Amadon Chablis. Chablis. <laughs> yeah. In the big bottle. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. But we would drink it and we would sing and sing and, and dance. Uh, it was really quite beautiful. Did you participate in Weiss's farm retreats once it got, once sure. they got going? Oh, sure. you mean, did we, you and me? Yeah, we went to Weiss's I've farm. I've never been to Weiss's farm. Where did we go? <laughs> what? Where did we go? Weiss's farm is a special thing, Mark. Wiener used to go to that and a few others. But we did go with I've, people from mm, other Harvard Road. I, I don't going? want to argue with you on camera or at all. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember the name of the camp. But Weiss's farm is Weiss's well, farm. That's the point. Cuts Camp is what I have in my head. Oh, all right. What's Cuts Camp? Cuts Camp was another retreat center From the reform. Where, where many Chavarot members gathered together a few times. Right? From the three Chavarot? Yeah, three yeah. Chavarot. Well, it was yeah. Uh, in Pennsylvania. Cuts Camp is in Pennsylvania. Um, and there were people from Philadelphia, people from Boston, and people from New York. But that was much later. I was going to say, that's... Much later. Uh, yeah, I confused it. You're right. We never did go to Weiss's Farm. You did start to tell us earlier about um, Beit Chavara, which was also a little bit later. Um, but can you tell us what that was and how it... Came well, there were like three Chavara. There was one in Boston, uh, in Chavara Shalom, and us, New York Chavara, and... Uh, in Washington, D.C., the Fabrengen. So um, there, was, there was an idea that we could have like a, a common retreat center, and we looked around, and we met a few times, and, and then we, we decided on a place called uh, in uh, Norfolk. Uh, North, Norfolk, Connecticut, called, uh, and uh, we call it Beit Chavara, and it was going to be our retreat center. Uh, and it was, um, it was a serious thing. We all made investments in it. We became members of a, of a corporation. It was a legal thing drawn up. Uh, then the neighbors, because uh, what was this house? It was a, it was a huge, it was a mansion uh, that uh, uh, the family had, um, you know, uh, decided to break up, you know, decided to sell. It was a big, mm. rambling Victorian. Yeah. With lots and lots of bedrooms. And lots of rooms, yeah. So, it was on three floors. But the locals got angry because they thought we were going to buy it, tear it down, develop it, you know, maybe break up the property and everything like that. So there, there was a town council meeting, and we had to, we got hired law league lawyers. Um, there was a claim it was anti-Semitic, and we, we even had an ADL lawyer come and defend us. Um, I, I, my memory of it is kind of murky. I, we went there a few times. We would spend weekends there, but uh, this, for the record, um, I, I don't want to give misinformation. It's something worth pursuing, and you could talk. To, I can off camera. I could tell you the names of the people, or I can tell you now if you want some of the people who would know more about it. Yeah, Let's. Um, who would know? Uh, 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 you know, Steve Cohn. Um, uh, Steve. Uh, the other Steve. Yeah, well. The other Steve. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the sociologist. The, uh, yeah, he, he would know. He was one of the active members of it. Um, uh, Jay Greenspan would know something about it because he actually lived there for a year. Uh, he was like the. Um, Caretaker? Well, I'm trying to figure out a nice word for it. He was the executive director. <laughs> He was a shamus. Yeah. You know who else was active in the Beit Chavara was uh, Everett uh, Fox. Yeah. Because he, his marriage yeah. was up there. His wedding was up there even. Right. Yeah. Do you know them? I do. I just saw them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Ask, ask Sherry and Everett Sherry, about Beit Chavara. Sherry will know a lot yeah, about Yeah, yeah. That's where the wedding was. We have pictures to prove it. <laughs> How, do you remember what year approximately Beit Chavara was it started? It was before 1980. Oh, yeah. 74 uh, 75. I, uh, my guess would be 76. Sounds like this was after the period of Weiss's farm, essentially. Maybe, maybe, yeah. yeah. yeah maybe some so. of the Weiss farm people went to it, you know, because they were missing it from Weiss's farm, so they joined that thing. Weiss's farm were the early meetings of the three Chavara. Right. Yeah, right, right. Was Ali involved in the Chavara? No. No? Okay. Okay. Okay, so I want to... The Moshewitzes were? Yeah, the Moshewitzes were. What were we going to say? I wanted to move to the, the question of tefillah. Okay. Um, within the, within um, the Chavara. Um, so, how would you describe the attitude towards tefillah? What role did tefillah as a communal activity and sort of area of focus play within, within the 
the sort of priorities of the Chavara? I would divide it. I would say that there were three priorities. One was tefillah, one was community, and one was food. And I think that they each got equal play. A third, a third, and a third. I, I really think so. Uh, I remember we moved to New Jersey, and we went, Zev went more than I did, to the Tinek Chavara. And my feeling was, and all they had was Shabbat services and a little food afterwards. My feeling was they took themselves way too seriously and they didn't eat well. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, they were more of a minyan. Yeah. yeah I mean, that, that's like a, all these little, you know, different groups. So what, some people organize around a minyan now, and some, some people organize around the community aspect. Uh, one thing about the Chabarah was, uh, I know you want to talk about tefillah, but it, it, I got this idea that I wanted to say earlier, and that's that... Um, in some ways, it was like a, a, a cauldron for a lot of other ideas and movements that came out of it. So, um, uh, for example, the Jewish catalog came out of the Chabura, both in Boston and New York Chabura. Uh, it was called the Jewish Whole Earth Catalog at the beginning. Uh, and uh, most of the writers were somehow, Richie's uh, and Stressful's contacts were through the Chabura. I, I was saying that writer was the, but I, I, was, I was on a tangent about how it was a cauldron for a lot of other things. For, for a lot of other activities, right? Right. So, so you were talking about the Jewish catalog. Yes, the Jewish catalog is one thing that came out of it. Of course, that's right, Hashim came out of it. But then there were false starts. Like, uh, there were two people, two guys at the beginning who were gay. They did not seem to, I mean, they, they were open, one was openly gay, uh, but there was no, um, he didn't seem to feel that he had a, you know, in other words, other gay people didn't come in, and he didn't form a kind of gay Judaism out of it. So that was one thing that didn't work. Uh, later on, lesbianism came in, but at that point, they, we only had one gay member who was outwardly gay. Uh, and that was something that was also growing in the early 70s. That, you see, that's what I'm putting out, that did, did not happen in the Chavara. So there were like, it was a cauldron of some things that were coming up, but some things were not. The anti-war movement, of course, was a big deal. Uh, now, our tefillah took the form of trying to incorporate those things. So um, there was a lot of group activities that, that, that like the, the, um, you know, singing and chanting and things like that. Uh, was by, and so we incorporated some of that, some of those modes of, of, of worship, uh, sitting on the floor, uh, sitting in a circle. Like uh, today, people have Karl Bach minions, which have a lot of singing in them. In the early days of the Chavara, there was a um, a uh, conscious effort to put more singing and less shuckling, if you will, into, into tefillah. Mm. And it worked, and uh, people really got into singing um, the prayers as opposed to just uh, racing through them. That sound fair? Yeah, some people were really into tefillah, too. Richie Siegel used to do a great minion. Uh, I think his name was Noam. Do you remember? Noam Sachs. Yeah, Noam Sachs. Noam Sachs, um, who made Aliyah, um, did a great tefillah. Uh, and uh, Chash Borowitz was an opera singer. He did a great tefillah. Some people loved doing it. Um, and there were women Arlene who, led, Agus, who uh, led services. Uh, Leora Fishman, Arlene Agus. These, you know Ar Leora probably from Boston. Uh, <coughs> So uh, singing was a big part of it, and singing well, you know. Uh, what, what kinds of things were sung? Were, for instance, Chavrat Shalom was very into nigunim, and uh, they could sing for hours. Uh -huh. uh, what, what kinds of music were being, was being sung here? Nigunim, but also um, um, melodies that had been um, uh, composed for particular prayers that different people found and taught the group. And I can't think of anything off the top of my head. A new melody for Luchado D, for instance. Um, new as in new? New to reason, us. New to new, you. New to us. So someone had learned it somewhere. Right, or heard right, it somewhere. right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are many um, uh, songs, if you will, that are embedded uh, in um, uh, repetitions of the Yamida that people would bring t to the group to teach them to sing, and they would be incorporated as a regular part of the tefillah that way. 
we also were not that strict about you know how to uh, about um, the the rituals of the fila. You know, you could skip something you didn't want. Um, we wouldn't say you know not yoitse if you don't do this or that of the service. So uh, the person, it was often you know somebody's in charge of the service, so we would kind of do what that person did. Uh, that person would plan it, and that person was not being led uh, by necessarily by halakha considerations about what would be a kosher service and what would make you yotze. Uh, right. want to sing this. One time, one person took newspapers, and he felt that one way to really you know explore God's presence in the world is by reading the newspaper in a tefillah context. And so he had, had actually he gave us all articles in the news, from the daily newspaper that we read out loud at certain points um, to kind of bring that into the thought on Shabbat, you know, of the distance and how we're involved in the world, not involved in the world. I thought it was a very great, I thought it was really good stuff. Right? Did, did you ever experiment with chanting in English? I mean, using the, the Nusach, for instance. Like, like uh, Art Waska used to do a lot. And, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, also. yeah, and, uh, uh Zalman, Rob Zalman used to do that. I don't remember that, do you? I I remember. When we do, you know, let's do like Rob Zalman does it, but it was never a, no, I don't remember that being done much. I liked when he did it, you know, and listening to did him. Did Zalman come ever to the New York Havara to Dublin with you? No, we had no. some people who got smicha from him or going or studying with him, but uh, no, he, we had other visitors came. though. We had some good visitors. Oh, we did. Yeah, one time Shlomo Karabach came. He just wanted to see what we were like, you know. We told came us on a, to an actual service or yeah. to, a to, to a no. I think Thursday night show. we walked in. It wasn't oh, Shabbos. Right, right. It was Thursday night we just walked in and there he was sitting there, you know. He wanted to ask us about us and everything, and he, we talked. He told us a lot about the House of Love and Prayer. I think it was, you know, like uh, trying to find uh, recruits, uh, uh, borrow it through. Did you say that was much of an influence in the New York Cobra? No. Uh, well. You thought so? I don't think so. Indirectly, Richie Siegel, uh, as a Zalman Chassid, um, uh, Lynn Gottlieb at least started, studied with him. And there were others. Yes, no, I think his presence was an influence. Not, not directly, but... Um, his attitude of bringing to bear, bringing into the uh, in, into Judaism uh, religious ideas from other contexts, uh, it wouldn't have been looked down upon. Uh, at one time, one person, uh, maybe it was Noam Sachs, he did a whole thing on uh, uh, before the Shema, if you do it by yourself, he said, El Melech Ne'aman, El Melech Ne'aman. And he wanted to make that into a chant by repeating it over and over and over, El Melech Ne'aman, El Melech um, So that, you know, you could say it's somewhat like in the air, Zalman stuff in the air. <laughs> uh, making a mantra, that's, you know, El Melech Ne'aman into a mantra. So many people have pointed to this sort of tension between um, tradition and innovation. I'm sure sort of emblematic of what Tefillah was like in many of the early Chavarot. Uh -huh. um, can you think of other ways in which, for, for one thing, do you yeah, think... The, 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 the Devar Torah. Devar Torah was, I mean, sometimes we had scholars who, who really knew that, uh, who, who uh, I mean, like David Sperling, for example. I mean, you know, he's now a, a Bible professor at uh, at, JIR, at HUCJR. Uh, so he would sometimes be uh, kind of iconoclastic in a way that you might not expect in a service, especially after here we're singing about the spirituality of God's presence everywhere. And then we would have a, uh, a very uh, scientific, dry uh, sermon pointing out that uh, none of these things really happened and that this is a contradiction with this. But I loved it. <laughs> David would give that kind of a uh, David, yeah. 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 Uh, but n not always that cynical, but he would sometimes really you know, try to point out what, 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 you know, what's really going on with this? Uh, well, we had other scholars, so we had David B Bob Goldenberg, who was another uh, rabbi pr professor, and he would uh, give a good, he would explain Talmudic stuff that, you know, I had always thought it boring, but he would present like what the key issue was and how it expressed itself. And this was good stuff. So in this way, we weren't innovative at all. We were being very traditional because we had some of the, <laughs> some of the top uh, scholars in the, in, in, the, in the country. Yeah, but what they would talk about <laughs> in the Devar Torah was not what you'd find in your run-of-the-mill conservative synagogue. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, but that's the, the yeah. difference. How would they talk differently? Well, they, <laughs> they, would, they would question the historical reality of something. And you didn't find that in the conservative synagogue. <coughs> or the spiritual reality. It wasn't <laughs> exactly Torah me Sinai uh, at a conservative synagogue, but a lot closer than it was in the Chavarah. Yeah. 
What about contemporary issues? Did those make the, their way into the tefillah, either through the liturgy or bringing in additional readings or music? Like or what? In the, music, yes. I, would, I adapted some. the war, anti-war stuff, civil uh, rights, well, yeah. kinds of issues. Music, I, I took some popular songs and I would do certain prayers to those songs. And we, we practiced, Marilene and, uh, and Rim and I would practice those. And, we did uh, Shokhei Natu, I think a Dylan song, stuff like that, yeah. if that's what you mean. Uh, and, um, and some civil rights songs I would, I would sing. Uh, such, I'd as. Um, such as They Will Rule the People. They will rule the people, they will rule the people. Um, what is that? I don't know it's that. a song that I remember from then. They will rule the people. They will rule the people. I don't remember how it goes now. Um, but uh, I did that one. And, uh, this little light of mine, but I think we just sang that. I don't think we, uh, I don't think we put any Hebrew words to it. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, you know, I'm gonna let it shine. Uh, I, I knew a lot of the freedom songs because I was in the, uh, the the movement. So uh, we so would you sing would those. So you would bring those into the. Songs? Yeah, and we'd sing them in the car going up to the retreat and back. You know, it was part of the, part of the part of the uh, stuff, um, part of what went on. Uh, would you sing We Shall Overcome, songs that were like that basic? We would do, well, but, yeah, but a little more uh, esoteric than that one, yeah. You see, that's very corny, right? We Shall Overcome. Right, <laughs> we, right. we, we, we were, like beating we your too swords cool for that. into plowshares. <laughs> what? Okay, yeah. beating your swords yeah, into well, plowshares. The, the, uh, that kind of music. Uh, anyway, there were, there were freedom songs that we would sing. And, um, Ask another question, though. I, I'm getting a little off track on what the question was. The question had to do with the kinds of contemporary um, materials, whether it was poems or songs. Or poems, yes, I would take uh, for holidays. What I would try to do is find a lot of contemporary poems, um, and I would make a kind of um, reading or Haggadah, uh, and I would uh, make copies, and I would pass it around, and everybody would have maybe, oh, maybe 15 uh, poems. Um, and they would read them in a circle. And they would all be somehow related to the service of the holiday. Um, and sometimes I would, um, as a refrain, I would put in some of the prayers from that holiday that were familiar. Mm -hmm. And everybody would read it. You know, there were English poems. Sometimes there would be translations. Mm -hmm. I did that a few times. Tell them about al I mean, well, I wrote a poem, yeah, al where I took the, the al and I adapted it. And uh, I, I'm a poet, so I did I That's one thing, you know. There weren't that many other poets in the Chabra, uh, uh, but there were uh, there were some people that were involved in the arts. But there's some area uh, that that I think we were not as um, uh, active in as, as uh, we could have been. I think it was it was the arts. Uh, we were more academic people, you know, and, and intellectuals in that sense, and the, the creative arts, as we call. It, you know, uh, uh, there was one guy who had finished um, uh, graduated Yale uh, School of Drama. Uh, and he was, was interested in theater for a while, and, and he was in the Chabra. Um, I, was, I was interested in poetry. Uh, we had people, of course, like literature students, like Alan Mintz, but we, he was not a practicing poet, even though now he's a, he's a good translator of poetry. Uh, we had, um, what other artists did we have? Alan Sugarman was a graphic artist, uh, but not practicing dance. at the time. What? Dance. With dance, we had uh, a dance therapist. Uh, and um, for a while, yeah, that, this is like her profession was dance therapy. We had a lot of people who liked Israeli dance, but uh, uh, so um, yeah, Al Khait was one example of my taking a, a from the liturgy, and we read it on Yom Kippur, right? He took Al Khait and reworded it to make it meaningful today, and it was quite powerful. How many verses was it? It goes on, so I think it's the longest poem I've written. Uh, it was over about five pages, right? And then it was used. To, uh, it was used twice before. It was used in the uh, Jewish calendar. Uh, uh, Michael Strassfeld uh, excerpted it from the Jewish calendar. And when he was excerpting it, it's a funny story. He called me up about the rights, you know. So I said, "How did you hear about this poem?" He said, "Well, because um, it was in the uh, the 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 Moxer. I said, "What Moxer?" And it turned out the United Kingdom used the poem in their official United Kingdom uh, reform uh, moxer. And I, I looked at I wrote him a letter. And they said, yeah. And they, so uh, I finally found out I published it in a magazine response. 
uh, and they had gotten the rights from Response, just the uh, not Response <laughs> didn't tell me, which is what, it was Steve Cohn was running. I, I worked with Response too for about five years. I was their literary editor. Yes, uh, but um, uh, anyway, so it, it had this all this great success, right? <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Is it still used? You know? uh, if they still use the Moxer there in the Reform Congregation, or, the, or yeah, just the poem this, itself. Oh yeah, yeah. People use it still. Um, Do you it, have it? It would be wonderful for you to contribute. That. Yeah, I, I put a chapbook together. That's the title poem of it, and there's some other poems of that period. Do you have uh, a? I have a copy. I'll, I'll give it to you at the end of the thing. Sure. Um, and uh, uh, there was a chapbook, you know, like a little book of poems. I, I made a chapbook out of it. Uh, I was going to say something else about the. Uh, Anyway, so were you, you were actively writing poems during this period? And yes. Many of the, did many of them find their way into a service or some other? I would read them. So I would read them in the service sometimes. But when I did poetry for the group, though, most of the time I would take other people's poems and make a little anthology that people would then read. Or sometimes I would do a little lesson on a poem, you know, or talk about two poems. Um, reminded me of some theme in, in the holiday, you know, and I would take from uh, my English training. You know. Let's turn now to focus on the issue of gender and women's roles uh, within the context of public worship. Art Green called this period at the very beginning of these Chavarot as a pre-feminist moment. Feminism was beginning to uh, make real changes and inroads in how people felt, but it was just the beginning. The first rabbi, women rabbi, was ordained in 1972, so it was several years later. How, how would you describe the attitude towards women in communal worship at the beginning of the New York Havara, when uh, you first started in 1970? Uh, I, I, I think there was uh, no difference. I, I remembered from Ramah, I was always used to women praying, girls praying, and we were always mixed. I was in Ramah as a, I already graduated high school, but uh, I had always seen that. Now, I had not seen women lead the service, but so integrated and participating, uh, uh, I had always seen it, so I did not find it surprising. Or something hard to get used to, it seemed natural. What, what was your perception of it at the very beginning as a woman? It was very similar. Um, there were women in the Chavara who learned how to lane. Learned when? Um, I would say in the early 70s there were some who learned. Who? Um, Arlene Agus was laning in the in the beginning, but she always knew. That's the point. No, well, I thought you meant from from the from the feminist movement. Did they then go on to learn to well, lane? Well, uh, that I'm happened. taking exception to what you're saying because Arlene grew up in an Orthodox family, but she could lane, and she learned to lane, and that was a pre-feminist position because women weren't laning then. Right. It was an unusual. It was very unusual. Where did she learn? I don't know. I don't know if she was self-taught. I have no idea, but she did know how to lane. Um, did anybody else? Any other? Women well, that's know? what I'm trying to think of. Did Lynn, Lynn Gottlieb know how to lane? I think so. Well, she had grown up in the reform movement. If right. Correct. Right. Um, I. I think Martha knew how to lane, but I I'm not sure. I think maybe Martha knew how to lane. I think I remember her doing the Megillah. Yeah, I think you might be right. Now, I remember when Phyllis, that was many years later, because our, our son was already born. Phyllis uh, learned how to lane. Yeah, and the Megillah, because I remember she did the Megillah, right, to take a so a large, the Megillah. women were not laning. When you right, because they didn't know. Because they didn't know, and that was one of the issues, that women had this huge gap in what they had learned. In learning, to yeah, exactly. As, as children and, and right. teenagers. Right. Um, right. So um, what, what roles do you remember women having? Um, did they have public roles in the, in the service? So they weren't laning. What in were the they beginning, were they the in the beginning, no. not much, mm -hmm. not much. I remember thinking about how striking it was when a woman did uh, lead the service, because there a, a woman's voice was just so conducive to to prayer. I mean more so than many men, actually. That I remember thinking. Were women wearing, any women wearing talesi? No. Kippah? No. That's oh. much later. 
No. I remember uh, the first Kol Nidre that we did, uh, Aliyah did Kol Nidre. Yeah, Aliyah Cheskis Kotel did Kol Nidre, I remember that. And that was pretty early. Yeah, uh, that you might check, uh, you could ask her. <laughs> yeah. Leslie, to, to what extent had you been involved in the women's movement and second wave feminism as it was starting? Well, let me preface that by saying that had we gotten married six months <laughs> later, I wouldn't have changed my name. When I got married, March 1970, women were, were not keeping their maiden names. They were changing. Six months later, everybody was changing their name. You mean everybody was not changing? Everybody was keeping their name. Everybody was keeping their name. That's what I meant. So, uh, and then um, as Ratna Shim started, um, it grew out of the Chavara, and I was a member of Ezrat Nashim. Can you talk about the beginnings of Ez How did Ezrat Nashim um, emerge and from where? I think it was Judith and Martha and Liz. Can you please use less names also? Okay, <laughs> Judith Plaskow, Martha Acklesberg, Liz Colton. Uh, I think they were the, um, the initiators. Paula Hyman. Paula. They did, they, they, uh, did a, um, a demonstration at the RA convention. No, that's way later, okay. way later. In the beginning, Ezrat Nashim was a consciousness-raising group. It was a group of women who needed to talk to each other about our roles in the world and how we functioned. This was sort of a direct outgrowth of, of second of the, wave feminism. Yeah, absolutely. And we were reading, groups. we were reading all the feminist literature at the time, devouring it. Were uh, you part of that? And group I was as well? part of that group. Um, was, I, it, was it seen as, in the very beginning, was it seen as an activity of the Chavara, or it was a group of friends no, who it were was, in a consciousness raising group? It was a subset of the Chavara. Everybody who was in it was from the Chavara in the very, very beginning. And then there were some other people, some other women who joined. Uh, and the primary purpose in the beginning was consciousness raising, which was going on all over the country in small groups. And then it morphed into what are we going to do about the conservative movement mm. and their um, archaic attitudes towards women. So we used to go to synagogues, two or three of us at a time, and uh, talk to whoever would listen to us, whether it was a, a, a sisterhood group or a congregational group. Uh, we would go around the Northeast primarily, trying to convince them that women should um, have uh, participate equally in in uh, tefillah. When was this in relation? When when did the the, the group first start meeting? Was that? I'm gonna guess it started around seventy three, maybe. It's earlier, 71, it, 71, it was seventy one. Seventy one, seventy two. See, I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. Um, and and um, then we started visiting synagogues. I'm gonna say a year later, but I could be wrong about the dates. Was the, and then they went to the RA convention. Was the group? Wh at what point did the group sort of name itself as Ratna? I don't know. Pretty early on, because I remember it was a very clever name. It was a very clever name, and I remember, I think, uh, Judith, or maybe Martha, explaining the name, why they took that name. Can you it, say it, what you remember about that? Well, as Rat Nashim, it means the, uh, it's the section uh, for women in a synagogue. Uh, but, it's, but it also means like woman's territory is our Nashim. So it, it's like a good double meaning. It's like sticking it to them. This is our territory? Okay, here's what our territory looks like. So it was a very, very clever Very thing. clever. Yeah. So you went around speaking to other groups and starting to uh, talk about sort of a, a different role for women. Right. And right. what kind of reception were you getting? Um, some places. Neutral, some places positive, not too, not too much negative stuff that I remember. 
uh, I remember a lot of curiosity. You know, like we were, this was a weird phenomenon that was occurring and, and they had a lot of questions to ask us. In the very early period after the founding of Ezra and Nashim in 1971-2, early 1972, yeah. there was also a, a, a conference, a women's conference yes. that convened in New York. Yes, yes, yes. And we all went. You um, all went? And you, were you instrumental in... in some, people were, some people were instrumental in um, creating that event. I was not a creator. I was an attender. Mm -hmm. What um, do you remember about it? Um, I remember how pleasantly surprised I was that there were so many people there, that this was important enough for all these people to gather. And there were Orthodox women there too, which also impressed me, not that much was going to happen. Uh, uh, I remember Blue Gr Greenberg was there. And, and the fact that her presence was very meaningful. Yeah. The next year they did the men and women's conference. Here. Right. Exactly. Did you go to that one? Yes. Yeah. I remember that very well. It was very good. And from that we formed uh, a men's group at the Chavara. It was kind of reaction, not reaction. Yeah, I guess reaction. Response, were, anyway. Yeah, response. Response. Uh, but we formed it there. I mean, but well, that was... Well, well, before you talk about that, I'm curious what, what um, kind of... Um, conversation, the forming of Ezra and Nashim and this women's consciousness raising group had within the Chabara. Um Did it did it elevate the conversation about women's roles and did it become an active part of uh, the discussion within the Chabara at communal meetings and, el and elsewhere? Interesting you say it because I remember one person, I think it was Lynn Gottlieb, pointing out that there was no discussion, no challenge of it. And she took it as a sign that, that we just were laying down. The men were just laying down. In fact, and we all kind of agreed happened. to it. We said, yeah, what's the problem? Fine. But she saw, she wanted there to be a, 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 a but we, yeah, okay, women, hey, that's a great idea. I, I don't know any men in the Chavara who had any objection or, that's why it wasn't discussed in that sense. Now, in men's group, we talked about issues uh, as, as men, but our response to feminism, I mean, I, everybody just thought it was a great idea. Would you say, as a man, that it had been in your consciousness before the beginnings of uh, this Ezra? Well, certain things, yes, like the equality in services uh, and, 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 the, and the equality in, in intellectual pursuits. Uh, because if you raise an upper middle class Jewish environment, I mean, you, you always know girls and boys are, are smart. Girls are usually smarter, but there's certainly there's, you never think of that. I mean, I don't know any guys in that situation. Now, when it comes to other things, you know, like, um, oh, like, like marriage dynamics and who cleans up and that kind of you know, daily stuff. Of course, of course, there's, there's, and, and a lot of other male traits. But as far as like uh, politically and as far as intellectually, um, I, don't, I, don't, I know I didn't and I don't think anybody else uh, felt, that, felt any uh, opposition. A lot of men at that time were starting to identify themselves as feminists. And, and maybe that's... Um, where this feeling uh, came from, um, that it's no big deal. These women are no different than we are. Some men have said that they weren't really focused on issues of women's roles and status until, until Ezra Nashim and the beginnings of Jewish feminism, that it was in their, at best you could say, in their peripheral vision. But it wasn't an area of It focus. wasn't primary, yeah. yeah. Does that feel right to you? It's, it's hard to remember because it's such a big issue. Uh, oh, I know that intellectually, that is to say not only my, mentally, but peripheral vision. Like I'm thinking, I'm thinking like the old joke that you know uh, the civil rights movement and the peace movement was good, but uh, all the men were doing. Then we have the women to do, do all the secretarial work. That was like the complaint. Uh, and um, I did not notice that in my civil rights activity, there were women who were equally active, and I remember walking with them, and, and uh, it was a, 
one of the women was one of the chairman of one of the programs. Uh, so, uh, but like socially, like interrupting, things like that. Uh, these are things that, that men were not aware of, right. you know. So it's that, it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Were women counted in a minion at the New York cover of the women, as far as you know? As far as I know, they were. I'm pretty sure they were from the very beginning. I think Liz told us one time that there was a discussion at the very beginning, the founding year, about it. Before, the before we before our year, before but uh, this joined. is hearsay evidence, yes. But you can talk. I'm sure you're interviewing somebody from the actual first group, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they could tell. They you. would tell you. But from our time, women counted. Yes, mm -hmm. this was not unprecedented. The Reconstructionists were doing it, and the Reform were doing it. Uh, so, so some things were not at all radical, right? Well, they were radical. They were just being done. Right. Well, they, they, they weren't. Uh, they weren't. Uh, they weren't unheard of. Literally, what, you know. what was how did how did the men's group come to be, and what was its purpose? From that from that conference, it was a great conference. Bella Absick was there. I remember Martha made a great speech because uh, it was a question about this. I remember it from years ago. Like, is there the question at that time was is there a predisposition to certain activities? So it might not be society prejudice, but is there a, a predisposition to certain professions, certain activities, certain roles in life that women have against men? So she compared it to. Like, uh, like when you drop those uh, uh, tennis balls on, you know, these, um, uh, it's like a pyramid of nails uh, and, and you drop them and, the, and you drop them randomly, but it does seem to follow a natural pattern. So she said, that may be what there is, but there should be no laws in, in uh, interfering with that kind of thing. And any ball that wants to bounce out of the way should be able to bounce out of the way. And when I thought it was a great analogy, she of course developed it much better. Uh, but it's sort of like brought together, you know, a reality and an idealism and a situation, a solution very well. Uh, and I remember also, uh, we formed men's groups there. I mean, that's how we did it. That was the program. We would be in little groups. And Steve Cohn, the late Steve Cohn, had just passed away. He was in my group. That's where I met him. And we talked about, uh, you know, men's issues. And uh, um, then I also talked with uh, Richie what Siegel. Do you, what, do, what do you mean by men's issues? We're talking about how we, how we felt about being men and how we felt about our relationships with uh, other men and other women. And uh, did we feel that there was a sexist... Um, Thing operating on it, you know, were we were we sexist when we were uh, um, when we were dealing with women? Um, what was the question was power? Um, why should? Here's what came up in the discussion. Geez, uh, okay, what what if it's not for ethical reasons? Aside for ethics. Uh, ethical, why should men give up their power? You see, and this is interesting because it just, um, I, I was reading recently, like uh, on this line, they're talking about one of the miracles of civilization is the abol abolition of slavery. It's a new way of looking at it, right? Because <laughs> there's always been slavery. So, what idealism? ethical idealism got into humanity's minds in the late 19th, 18th century that they decided that slavery was immoral and should be illegal, you know? And it's that kind of new consciousness that humanity got. Uh, and it really it was a similar kind of issue in this, or maybe there's some analogy, you know? Consciousness raising. Yeah, it's, it's right. really it's a matter right. of consciousness raising. Now, what's so interesting <laughs> to me about this current dialogue is that... Current dialogue about what? About the men's group is that the men in that group pledged themselves to oh, yeah. silence. Mm -hmm. In other words, whatever was discussed in men's group never left men's group right. on pain of death practically. <laughs> So here we are, 40 odd years later, and this is the first time I ever heard that they talked about power. Well, that was, no, that was only in the men's group, in the Chavorah, before I'm the men's group. I'm but it was in the, in the men's group, it, it was the men's group meeting at, 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 the, okay. at the hotel. But the point the, is Steve Cohn, uh, that <laughs> they never, ever talked right. about what went on yeah. in men's group. Uh, and the women um, didn't exactly uh, run through the streets with bullhorns. But they just weren't that concerned about it, the way these guys were. 
Oh, about being secretive, yeah. About being right, secretive. Right. Yeah. It, it was so interesting, such a difference. Well, because the women's movement was more of a political movement, whereas the men's, we were really talking about our feelings about this. Whereas the women really, they, they had to change society. We just had to re talk about how we felt about it. So I, I felt I was one of the big defenders of it, that, there, that we'd be quiet about it. And in fact, I mean, there were issues. I mean, it, it, while the men's group was on, it had its, you know, it was strong periods and weak periods, you know, like Saturday Night Live. <laughs> uh, but... Um, at the, some of it's good times. I mean, we held some hands of some divorce guy getting divorced. We talked two guys into getting married. <laughs> so we're two for two, or two for, I don't know. Uh, and and, uh, uh, and if, I think if there hadn't been that sense of secrecy and of quiet, of, of complete, come with jelly, I don't know if it would have been, I don't know if it would have worked. So there. And of course, we used to tease them about it. Yes. And Bill Aaron would always tease me. He said, I tell you everything. <laughs> Sometimes we didn't even know where they were meeting. Let's, let's, what would you say were the key issues and concerns, as you recall them, of this the very early um, Jewish feminist um, Jewish feminism? Uh, and, and what was what was the change that? And what was the the, um, the vision of change that was? The vision of change was that uh, women should be admitted to rabbinical school. So one of the important visions was that women should be admitted to rabbinical school. Um, the issue of egalitarian services was a moot point for us because the Chavura was already egalitarian. But in most of the synagogues in America that wasn't the case. So when we did go talk to people in conservative synagogues, that's one of the things we talked about, how it was important for that change to take place. Did Sally Presan's ordination in 1972 have any impact? Um, it had, I would say, a minor impact because it was in the reform movement. And so they didn't see themselves as halachic to begin with. Um, and the, the issues were with this concept of halachic Judaism. And then how do you change halacha if you can? So how did women envision these changes actually taking place? Or being In the rabbinical assembly, that's where it had to take place. The rabbinical assembly had to decide that women could go to rabbinical school and that women could be counted in the minion. And what was going to push them in that direction? Ashrat Nashim. <laughs> um, you have enough very vocal women uh, who uh, are um, academically and intellectually on the same level, and it's pretty hard to ignore that, to not pay attention to it. Seb, did you want to say something? No, no. Just that, um, that one of the big things uh, in feminism, uh, men's response to feminism was whether they were married or not. Because feminism, I think, had a bigger impact on the dating scene than it did on marriage life. Although it had an impact on marriage life, but not as much. So uh, I think that's a, I think you're asking, the wrong male when you're asking about the Ezra Nashim's impact. Why do you song. think it had more impact on the dating scene? Because if you're dating, then then, then I, I think then your relationship with uh, with women is much more uh, complicated. And once you're married, there's a certain amount of trust and love and everything else going on. But here, it, there's a lot more cat and mouse stuff I think going on and I disagree more complicated. With him. All right. Because I think that in the context of a marriage, when roles are spelled out based on tradition, and then somebody in that marriage wants to change the roles, that, that that's harder to accomplish because something's already been established. Yeah, all right, change is always hard in both cases. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's what I Wrong think. point. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Or children, anyway, certainly. Right. That's where a lot of you know, right, right, yeah. couples find themselves really up against trying to make decisions. About kids. About kids right. and who's going to take care of them. Well, I have to tell you a very funny story. I had a friend in graduate school who had a daughter who was a, year old, uh, who was a month older than our son. And both mothers um, saw themselves as feminists. We had a boy, she had a girl. So we wanted them to be uh, gender neutral, these kids, in terms of their activities. 
So she kept giving her son trucks and I kept giving my son, she kept giving her daughter trucks and I kept giving my son dolls um, in the hopes that uh, it would uh, have an impact on their attitudes towards uh, gender roles later on in their life. And how'd that work? Well, at the time, I mean. At the time, my son loved his dolls. Uh, he had one doll that he called Baby Billy, who was so lifelike that people would sort of have heart attacks when they saw him carrying Baby Billy by his foot down the street. But the other thing is with our daughter, we gave her, you know, carpenter stuff and everything like that. But then my father, for her first birthday, my father got her a doll and a baby carriage. And, and it was immediately over. Immediately she knew what to do with it. Immediately she took the doll carriage. It was over. It, it was, was so over. funny. Yeah. Of course, if you give it to a son, a boy, he might also have known what to do with it immediately. Well, we didn't do that scientific We gave test. our son a, a, a shopping cart. Yeah. <laughs> now, boys didn't push shopping carts right, back right. then. Only girls did. Right. He pushed his shopping cart. <laughs> and he put all the guns in there. Right. <laughs> um, to what extent, if at all, would you say that differences between the conservative and reform movements in regard to their interpretation regarding um, uh, relationship to halakha or practices regarding women's status and roles sort of had an impact on the Chavara. Did the reform movement, the fact that the reform movement had already made a lot of these changes have an impact or was that? I don't think it had any impact. I don't think that that most of us paid much attention to what went on in the reform movement. Um, the only um, credence, if you will, that we gave to the reform movement was based on the fact that some of our members went to reform rabbinical schools. But even in those, even for those members, they were way more observant than, than the people they went to school with. But the reform movement and the changes in the reform movement, I don't think had much of an impact at all. Same in regard to the Reconstructionist movement? Uh, Reconstructionists were different because they were like us. They were like cousins, sort of. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, we paid a little more attention to that. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? And some of our members felt comfortable enough that when the Chavara finally uh, saw its um, regular demise, in other words, no longer an apartment, no longer uh, retreats and services all the time. Many people joined the Reconstructionist movement. Right. And when was that, just to place that in time? I'm going to say the early 80s. Does that make sense? Right, but we can't place the year. It's some place in the early 80s. Early 80s. Yeah. Uh, are there any instances that you remember that sort of are, illust illustrate how change actually came about um, in the services. You, what, you've mentioned one already, which is women learning to learn. Right. Right. And so that was one. Is there, are there other things that you can think of? Yeah, there's the naming of Saranachama Merowitz. Remember? Uh, because it was on Shavuos. And uh, there was a woman laning, and I think it was a, a woman who did the uh, naming. Well, Rim was a rabbi, so he must have done the naming. But there was a lot of, but Judy, I think, did equal. Remember, tell the story. So there's something about it. The other thing that was significant mm -hmm. was that traditionally you named a baby girl in the synagogue of the service. Okay? Um, and the counter to that was a bris, which was a big simcha. So baby namings became big simchas. For girls, right. For girls, right, and right. they did not occur in synagogues. And, and that they was weren't a, on a specific date, date right. after the birth. Either. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that, that was significant. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, but what was the significance of Rim, of uh, Sarna uh, besides that it's a photograph by Bill Aaron that's is quite famous? <laughs> I think you have a woman laying the Torah. I think Judy laying the Torah for her own daughters, because uh, it was, uh, was Shavuos. There was some significance to maybe, it. Maybe, maybe. I don't remember. But now that I'm thinking about it... Um, Telling moments, uh, yeah. Alana Ruskay was not named in Shul either. She was named in, in their apartment. Yeah, and a rabbi participated, her father. Her grandfather. Her grandfather, yeah. Sure, his father. So, 
I don't know if that's a tradition. Well, anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah you're supposed to name the baby. Big, that was a big difference, and I think maybe the Chavarot were the first ones to start naming baby girls uh, outside of synagogues, and that has caught on. I mean, almost everybody does that now. Right. Those were, that was a period where Simchat Bat ceremonies were handed around. Right, you know, right. That's right, we have. Right, when our daughter around. was named, um, I got multiple copies different. from different people, <laughs> and then we just took them all and made our own. Do you remember uh, when women started wearing uh, a talus uh, or kippot? I don't know why I think this, and I could be dead wrong, but I have a feeling that started at Schechter. I don't know if I'm right. Maybe that's just when I became aware of it, that uh, uh, um, girls who went to Schechter and had bat mitzvahs wore taluses. And it, it seemed to me that that's where it came from, but I don't know if I'm right. Okay. Any other thoughts, Seth, on that? I'm trying to think of telling moments that really show the difference. Uh, as far as uh, women wearing kippot, the uh, I can't think of any particular one time. Even now, though, I think it's um, optional. Uh, well, one thing, like the women wearing talisim that looked like a woman's garment instead of the, the and then the men would, would pick that up on that. And so you have men now who have very decorative talisim too, so it's become a whole thing. And that's perhaps a sign of the times. That's, you were looking for that kind of stuff. How, yeah. how about um, adult? Um, but no, mitzvah. I think that's much later. Okay, so this wasn't happening at all? No, no that much, much later. What, a bat mitzvah? Adult bat mitzvah. Oh, oh, I see, I see what you mean. Uh. Okay, so let's turn now to, um, I want to talk a little bit more about social activism and um, particularly how it, how it led to um, Breira and uh, Sort of Jewish activism in that in that sense. So, um, as we've noted, the mobilization in Washington in November 1969, just before you joined the Chabura, was an activity that many people from the New York Chabura took part in together, going down together, and it was a real bonding activity for people who were involved in those first few months. Was anti-war activism and other kinds of general um, social movement activism a part of the Chavara in that early period when you were involved? Yes. When you got involved? Well, it was because the Chavara was a sanctuary, right? Well, the sanctuary is a technical word now. Yeah, I know, but, uh, but wasn't it, it? I don't remember that. I know that it was uh, legally a seminary so you could get a draft deferment, which they may have actually used for Burton Weiss. I thought uh, they used I don't know. That's a the story that you'll check out in more detail. Uh, that it was in fact a sanctuary, I don't know. What do you mean by sanctuary? That if you um, were not going to participate in this war, even though you had been drafted, if you were part of the New York Havara, you could avoid conviction. But that's not a sanctuary, that's a draft affirmant. Well... No, Burton Weiss sought sanctuary at the seminary. He wanted to make it, he wanted the seminary to stand up against the war and on those grounds, I don't know. Let's not talk to, about it because yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know, know the details. We don't know but enough. I know that I did go, and we did go together in a bus, or somehow we went. We drove we down went, to we went, But we slept at Farbringen on the floor one time. It was an anti-war right. thing, and, and right. it was Art Waskow's, and that's where we met Art, and that's where we, we slept on the floor there. And that was a Chabura activity. I think we had different cars, uh, and that was an, okay. There was the, the mobilization, the big one in 69, we went to. Right. But uh, that was not a couple of We just went there, I think the bus left from Columbia, and we went down there. And, uh, you went down. Yeah. A number yeah. of people did come down as together as the Havara. We, right, but, but we, yeah. did, we were Not part that of time. <laughs> we did it later, but not that. And then we went, we went down to Washington another time and slept in, our, uh, in Art Waskow's apartment. Well, yeah. For, for a demonstration. Yes, right. And one but, time I went down there just for uh, Shabbat, he invited us down. Uh, 
for the fun bringing. Right and back I think, to and That was like years later. I mean, we were friends yeah. with them. Yeah. So we went down so there. We continued to participate <laughs> as a cover up. The cover up would go together. Yeah, but <laughs> not in a big way. What? The, the peace movement? Yeah, not in a big way. Uh, I mean, you know, there was a demonstration every other week in Manhattan. Yeah. And we weren't running to every demonstration. That's what I mean by not in a big way. Yeah. There was also, though, with the Brera, I remember it would be like a discussion on Israel. And um, uh, it was like, okay, guys, listen, you know, we got to really start facing facts about this. And, and some people in graduate school were studying this and, and, and debunking some of the propaganda that we had been raised with. I, are you talking about Israel now and Brera? I'm talking about Israel and Brera. Okay, let, let's. I thought that's what you wanted to talk no, about. No, I do, but I, wanna, I just wanted to finish one last thing about, um, um, I'm sorry. about the uh, anti-war movement here. Some members created an organization called Jews for Peace. Were right. you, you aware of that? I was aware of it. I wasn't a member of it. Okay. okay. So there were some activities going on, but not everybody was involved. Right. In Very political were uh, Jerry Serrata, mm -hmm. uh, John Rusquet, uh, Peter Geffen, a little less, I think, or maybe a little more. I don't know, Peter. Uh, any other people who are very active in politics? Uh, Martha was a political scientist, but I don't know if she participated in a lot of like, the demonstration that way. I don't think so, no. Um, but the other thing that uh, it, you could consider social action was uh, Soviet Jews. Yeah. Was that an activity of the of the hover that people participated in? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There were tr there was. Um, people went I'm to the saying. Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was invited to go. I didn't go, but the, the people would sneak in. I did um, do uh, with Arlene Agus, who was a, the, she was like a, a part of the Kabbalah uh, bigger world. I don't think she was ever officially a member, but she was working for uh, Student Struggle for Soviet Jury, right. and we recorded uh, the uh, Pesach service um, all night long on tape, and then they were smuggled in. You know, I used to tell my son that everybody in the Soviet Union is uh, Russian. Listening to your voice. <laughs> they're, saying, they're making the same Hebrew mistakes I make. <laughs> and uh, uh, also, there was a time, one time uh, we demonstrated against the Bolshoi Ballet. So uh, uh, this I did with, uh, it was not really Chavra, but uh, it was it's also through Arlene, but also um, uh, uh, Debbie. W. Ugaritz. Mm. I think she was working there at the time. Um, so what we did was we, uh, we, 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 st we all had front row seats the Bolshoi Ballet, and then in the middle of uh, Act One, we stood up with a huge poster and said, Free Soviet Jury. I wasn't there. No, she, and then we were escorted out very, not, not violently, but you know, very uh, sternly. Hastily. Hastily. But it was, so I had never seen the Bolshoi Ballet, certainly not the first row. It is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but it was worth it. Look what we did, you know. Uh, when I would go to the UN, they would have a lot of demonstrations there. I would go. Uh, as, as all the I personally. The but I don't know. If, yeah, for, for the Soviet jury. Uh, I believe that strongly. I, I don't remember it as an, a specific Chavara activity. It wasn't, but there were many Chavara members who were involved. Yeah. So, as we've discussed, you'd both lived in, spent time in Israel, lived in Israel, you'd been part of the Mahon. Um, and uh, what was your take on the situation, sort of in those in the early seventies before the before the nineteen seventy three war? The situation in Israel. The situation in Israel. Well, we were. I mean, I still I think uh, held a lot more. Of, uh, um, I, I, I believe more in the labor line than than. Uh, I believed Israel was a lot more innocent. Uh, and then in some of the lectures uh, and some of the readings I did, I started realizing that it was different and more complicated than that, much more complicated. And then uh, there was a very, that was, this is when Bray Ra was starting. Um, and um, then there was the Yom Kippur War and that um, set Bray Ra back quite a bit. And, uh, what, what's your recollection of, of how Bray Ra was actually founded? How did it come to be? Uh, I, I think it was that um, John, and uh, John Ruske and Jerry Serrata uh, were uh, sometimes on uh, Thursday nights, uh, they would uh, talk about some uh, issues you know, about Israel, about uh, the wars, about Palestinians, about uh, uh, 
uh, about you know the the, the matzah, the situation, and they would they would show different perspectives, and we started realizing that the the idea ain bre ra, you know, there's no choice. There really was a choice. There may have been a choice. There may have been a bad, and that uh, and that uh, there's a certain degree of um, misinformation that we're being given, and I, I moved more to the left and more hostile to uh, the uh, the the. I mean, I was always against the could, but then I started, you know, questioning even the labor policies, and I, I think I, you know, I'm still uh, on that side of, of uh, challenging a lot of the, the government positions. Yeah. Were you involved at all? In no. 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 Um, Zeb, were you involved in any activities related to Brera early on? Yeah, one time there was a, uh, I, I, I demonstrated and. Uh, and uh, tried to uh, disrupt a meeting, I think, of Likud uh, on behalf of Brera. Uh, um, and uh, they, they, like, pushed me out, you know. I was trying to interfere with, a, there was some conference, I think, at the Waldorf, and I was going in, they, they pushed me out. Uh, and I was holding up a sign. And, and they, I was, you know, you've gone to jail for that? They, uh, somebody asked me later. And I said, well, I guess I would have, but it was, you know, that kind of, I was just being aggressively uh, demonstrating against it because we didn't, we wanted to uh, challenge uh, some of the things that uh, the Likud, these are the, you know, the, the right way that, we're, that they were saying. Um, the times I've been to Israel since then, I have not demonstrated anything like that, but I make my positions pretty clear. I've written poems that are clearly on that side, of the, le the left, the challenging things. And were you doing that then? Yes. Uh, when I was with Response, I published some poems that were pretty challenging of Israel. One month after the Six Day War, I remember a pretty uh, powerful one, which I did not put in my anthology, my uh, my collected works. But well, uh, <laughs> what was the relationship? How would you describe the relationship between Brera and the New York Chavra and the Chavra, other Chavra? We we uh, Brera used uh, we we let Brera have its office, its New York office in our in our apartment. That was the office at the time, wasn't it? Was, it? Well, it was the New York headquarters. Yeah, I, I, did, I stuffed envelopes for him. <laughs> I forgot that part. Yeah, I would, I would go over sometime free afternoon and I would stuff envelopes. Uh, they hired this guy to, to run it, a uh, redhead guy, tall redhead guy with a red beard, I remember. Uh, I don't remember his name, do you? Uh, he didn't have much of a Jewish background. He came more into it from the left. And um, I, I think there was some feeling that he really wasn't... Uh, you know, he wasn't quite getting it, or he, he wasn't going to convince the people that we wanted to convince because he was, he was coming up from too much from the left. Um, that's a whole thing to explore, you know, uh, uh, our, 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 our relationship to, to the political left, because uh, uh, and that there's been a... Well, anyway, you want to ask about the early Kabbalah kind of days, so... Yeah, I think I've answered just about all the ones I have to say about it, unless you have more of a, a more direct question. Um. Brera only existed for about four years. It was uh, disbanded in 1977. Yeah, and then it became pretty much Peace Now, I think. That's where a lot of the people went. At least yeah. I, I got active in Peace Now, and I did some coordination for them and their visits to New York. Uh, early, Some of the early uh, leaders, I, I brought them. They, there was this conference at, um, or, or, uh, I don't know, lecture, I guess, uh, at uh, uh, SHA. Um, and I was I, I ran the PR for it, so I like sent out you know envelopes and uh, uh, mailings, and I did the press releases. And we got a good attendance, and I picked them up at the airport. You know, I staffed it basically, uh, so I did that activity with it. Um, Do you have any sense of I mean, or what is your sense of what led to the demise of, uh, of Shalom Hashem? No, of Brera. Uh, I, I, I can't be, I, I don't know. So you weren't involved to that extent? I was not involved to that extent. Yeah, in the, in the middle of it all. Yeah. Right. I, I, you, there, there may be a couple of people who know, but I, I would yeah. not be able to give that answer. I know that the, the, six, the, the Yom Kippur War set us back because then people say, you see, you can't trust the Arabs. How are you, you going to say there was a choice? There was no choice, but it was that kind of thing. Every time there's a war, it sets us back. And then you know, the left gets even more aggressive by saying, well, if we hadn't been like this, then there wouldn't have been a need for the war. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, if I were in charge, I don't know what I would do. But I do know that I felt my voice had to be heard. Right. So we've just talked about two examples of 
sort of organizations, important, important organizations in the Jewish community in the 70s that were sort of related somewhat, somehow, to the Chavara, both Ezra Nashim and uh, Breirat, which had very close associations, a tremendous overlap of people. But um, am I correct that they were not viewed as Chavara activities? They were not of the Chavara in that sense? level is the Jewish catalog and that there are a lot of activities, a lot of movements, a lot of product that, that came out of the Chabura years, uh, but the Chabura would not say that they owned any of it or stood for it, right? Yeah, I think he's right. It engendered a lot of other engendered. activities. How would you describe the role of and relationship of Response Magazine to the Chabura? You were involved with it, as you said, as the literary editor for th three years? Uh, yeah, three, years of, three or four so years, three yeah. Three or four years? Uh -huh. uh, it was commentary f for teens. <laughs> That's how we called it. Uh, it was, um, uh, it, it saw itself as the intellectual organ of the Chavara movement. So very related. Very related. But not sponsored by. Correct. See, that's what I think is key. Oh, that's the engineer's idea. As, as Ratnashim wasn't sponsored by, Braira wasn't sponsored by, Response wasn't sponsored by, nothing was sponsored by. As a matter of fact, Response predated the Chavarot in terms of when it was founded. Yeah, right. By a couple but, of years. But it really comes out of the same... Uh, mentality. So Jewish Jewish I don't want to say more than you because I don't want to go through every cliche in the book. Mentality. But mentality, right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you were the literary editor. Yeah, um, I, yeah. How did you see your role? What, what were you looking for? I was, I was looking for poets and writers who could, um, uh, who, who could uh, show the beauty of, Jewish con of Judaism and being a Jew uh, with new metaphors. See, it's very easy to be a bad Jewish poet because it's a language so rich in, in imagery and symbolism and, and narrative. Uh, it, so you can be a bad one because you can copy theirs, right? Uh, or you can, you know, copy in a clever way, and that's called midrash. But if you really want to be a poet and, and make your own, you know, figure out new images, new symbols in Judaism, that's what I thought the poet should do. So it was a pretty ambitious kind of thing. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, give a voice to the uh, the. Jewish counterculture and literature. Um, also, I wanted to uh, celebrate uh, Jewish literary scholarship. So, uh, in response, we published Everett Fox's Genesis. We also published David Rosenberg's uh, uh, experimental poetic translations of the Psalms, Blues for the Sky. We published uh, some of his uh, Isaiah. I also uh, commissioned a few translators to translate the same Psalm. Uh, and so we can put them side by side, you know, kind of synoptic text in different ways of, uh, of seeing the same psalm. Um, so I wanted it to, to be uh, erudite as far as you know, Hebrew knowledge is concerned. These people really have to be Hebrew to translate the psalms well. I also wanted it to be open and very democratic. So uh, I would get a lot of stuff over the transom, you know, uh, and, and I, I read every poem. And short stories I would skim usually, but I read every poem. And I would work sometimes with another editor who would joke with me all the time, you know, but I would read it all sometimes two or three times. Uh, and I tried to publish unknown people that I just got here. Um, and um, then there were some famous uh, poets that would submit stuff that I didn't like and I rejected those. But um, uh, we also, uh, in response, we saw ourselves, uh, I was the literary editor, but all the editors had a portfolio, but we were all in charge of all of it. In other words, we all voted on all the articles. So it was a lot of fun because I got to read the other articles and I saw how um, a, a lot of the, um, the deep questioning that we were doing was being done uh, on, on this level. I'm trying to think of some great essays that we published. I can't remember any. <laughs> I can't remember any. Um, I was just intrigued when you said new images for... Oh, right. Expression. Yeah. Well, I had this whole thing. I put a, I put a solicitation in uh, a Poets and Writers magazine for uh, aspiring poets and writers, and I said, "Response is looking for Jewish poems that aren't about the the Wailing Wall, the Friday Night Sabbaths, and uh, grandmothers." I think something like that. I, I listed about five or six cliches because almost every the poems were all having this stuff in it, you know. And the the idea of the po of poetry is is to refresh the language. And did you get many that were? What you consider to be new imagery? Yes, I thought so, yeah. And we published a lot of them, yeah. 
I, I can't think of the specific yeah. image, but yeah. a lot of times a poem would be working on a new level. It seemed to be showing, uh, showing something new about the, 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 the Jewish life, Jewish world. Yeah, yeah. Marsha Falk was doing a lot of great work with her, uh, and we published her. Uh, so I mean, there were people out there, you know, we were trying to publish them. Marsha Falk tried to, like, you know, Marsha Falk, she said a lot of good mm -hmm. stuff, and uh, uh, she's, uh, uh, you know, trying to, uh, well, find new imagery in Judaism on a feminist side, but the, the, the poetic, um, uh, and the, the poetic energy is still there, you know, she's focusing in on that, but that's what I was looking for, that kind of thing, do it with other things. Um. Okay, so let's, I want to move into the concluding section here. I just want to spend a little bit of time um, reflecting on uh, the impact the Chavara has had on your own lives um, and on the larger Jewish community. Um, so you said you, you've been members of the New York Chavara from its inception until today. Um, what would you say have been the most significant ways that the Chavara has um, evolved, changed over time, the New York Chavara? Well, it's evolved into something that's less than it was. And uh, part of that is because a lot of the energy left town. You know, uh, academics have to go where they're hired. You know, so Bob Goldenberg goes to Wichita, Kansas for God knows how many years. Gershon Hunter goes to Montreal, well, never comes back. Montreal is not Yenon, it's not well, Wichita. It's, no, but it's not New York. It's not New York. So a lot of energy was lost that way. And as people's lives got more complicated personally and professionally, they didn't have the same kind of time they had to devote uh, to the Chavara. Right. Us included. said the Chavara was a young person's yeah. so that, institution in its, conce in its mm. earliest um, conceptions. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, uh, in fact, the Chavara had tremendous influence in that there, the word Chavara is used all over the country to describe small groups of Jews getting together whether independent of a synagogue or in a synagogue. So that makes it a very important phenomenon, I think, in the development of uh, Jewish communal life. Um, so we don't have an apartment. We still get together uh, the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Some people actually go to Tashlich. Most of us just eat and back, catch back up. to the good food. <laughs> right, right. Um, so right now, would you describe it mainly as a, um, a friendship group? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. It's that community aspect of it that has endured. That's endured, endured. exactly, yeah. exactly. Fourth of um, July, we still have our barbecue. We have here. a bar. We, we used, used to, have to have New Year's Eve. Now we have a Fourth of July <laughs> barbecue, which, if it's on Shabbos, turns into a Fifth of July barbecue. Um, have you been involved at all in Chavara uh, movement activities as they have developed in the 80s and beyond the Chavara Institute, the Summer Institute, or those kinds of things? Not really. Not really. No. Hmm. No. Any sense of why not? Your lives change when you move out of New York. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. And you have to make connections, particularly when you have children, so that they can have connections. Also, so it gets diluted. The ties, the ties get diluted. Now, the synagogue we belong to now is probably the closest thing to a chavura that you could have that's called a synagogue. So this is not the Tinek chavura? No. Tina Kavara disappeared a long time ago. That was something that you were involved in briefly. Is briefly. Right? What was that? And when was it was that? a group that got together on Shabbos and had services and ate a little and took themselves too seriously. <laughs> um, we belong to a very small synagogue that has maybe 50 members that rent space in the church, that doesn't want to have a building fund, doesn't want to have to worry about the roof and the electricity and the plumbing. So the focus is all on communal activities and services. Tonight, usually once every other month, there's a potluck Friday night dinner. 
Yeah. Uh, once a month, there's you, or every other month, there's a lunch and learn. So it's the same kind of uh, energy, communal energy. Do you focus on the food? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but they don't focus right on the food, in my humble opinion. <laughs> they end up with too much pasta. <laughs> there's yeah. something else I would like to add about the Cabra Institute, why it didn't appeal to me. It's because it seemed like just another institute. Uh, the thing about the, the Chavura, that one of the aspects of the Chavura that was appealing was its uh, anarchy, its uh, non-formal aspect. Once you make an institute, uh, and then you have a director and an executive director, this and that, then it has that kind of leadership structure. It loses something. Now, I'm, a lot is also gained, and a lot of good ideas get changed. And I'm, I'm not against it. Just what I want to particularly participate in is something that is much less structured. Yeah. So in some ways, I think this is overall, uh, a lot of this is a matter of uh, disposition more than ideology or philosophy when you get right down to it. I, I mean, at least in my rank. I, I, I don't like uh, particularly, you know, having somebody, you know, I don't like the structure that much. And I, I, I feel more comfortable spiritually in a more loose environment. We also both, I think, share an aversion to top-down Judaism. Yeah, that's right. The top-down that, stuff. That's that's really an important so factor that's been here. An yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And in the cover and even though we both grew up in traditional conservative synagogues, well, or perhaps because you did. Or maybe because. Uh, now, take Cage for example. That was, you know, the uh, Cage. K A J. That's the uh, Coalition for the Advancement of Jewish Education, and that came somewhat out of the Chabad movement because Sherry and Everett were active, you know, and uh, um, a lot of the people who they hired. Now, they did try to capture some of that Chabad uh, idea uh, in in that anybody who wanted to teach a course basically could, you know, mm -hmm. and it was it was a wonderful system. Um, and then uh, a few years before it died, I'm not making a causal relationship, although I am, <laughs> they got much more strict about who could make presentations. And a lot of the weird stuff was lost, but a lot of the good stuff was lost. I went to some stuff at Cage that I walked out and it was so, so third-rate pseudo-intellectual. But there was some stuff there that was so good, done by really good scholars. And the music that came out of Cage. <laughs> right, the music was so much the fun. The music. They have all these, you know, pop, you know where, where are they going to go? You, you know, uh, Jewish American folk singers in the Shlomo Karbach tradition, although often singing in English, you know, in the Springsteen Karbach tradition. Yeah, you know, there are like hundreds of them all around. Where do they go? They go to the Cage Conference. It was great for right. that, too, yeah. Right. <laughs> I always come back with one or two CDs. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that, that, see, so. Um, the, but that might be a matter of disposition. I mean, I, I learned a lot from the weird places. Some of them were good, some were at the cage, I'm thinking. So I, I'm just sharing about disposition, I think. It's a matter of personality. One of the things that's striking to me in listening to you talk about your Havara today, I mean, your, your synagogue today, your Havara-like synagogue today, is that the piece that seems to be um, not at all foregrounded, at least how you've described it, is is sort of, uh, political activism, social acti social activism. They do it. Well, there's a lot in this synagogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of tikkun olam. There's a lot of volunteering stuff. There's a great emphasis on it. In soup kitchen. Uh, they go feed people in soup kitchens. They sleep overnight in, in shelters. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, a couple months ago, I, I donated an entire trunk full of clothing that will be distributed in the city. Um, there's actors a, home. They walk. They go to the actors home, an actor's home and in enter, They do like, services um, for the actors home uh, and hospital, in the hospital Engelheim down the hospital. street. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of in this particular synagogue. There's a, a, a major emphasis on tikkun olam. But you are right in picking up that we don't do it. <laughs> we <laughs> well, do, we do a little we do bit. A yeah. Little. yeah. Every year, uh, I get a list yeah. of. I get a family, a poor family and they list the um, ages of the parents and the ages of the kids and what they want for Christmas. Mm. And then I go shopping. And I usually spend about three times more than what they recommend. Um, and then you wrap everything in Christmas paper, you know, yeah. and then it gets distributed uh, family by family. And it's a very good feeling. Um, Zev, you mentioned that for you and Leslie, much of the Havara was what you called a time in our life. Yeah. 
Can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Well, um, we moved out of New York and, and um, a lot of the issues that we had in uh, our early years, um, we didn't, won't have any more. Um, so uh, I think that's what I meant. Now, you know, now I'm thinking, we used to make jokes when we were uh, in the 70s about how uh, there'd be a Chabura old age home. And then one of our members died and was buried in a cemetery in New Jersey, our friend Phyllis's husband. And I immediately said, I want to be buried next to Herman. And I want us all to be buried next to Herman. It's not going to happen. <laughs> but, but, you know, until that point, if somebody said, well, where do you want to be buried? Uh, my, my response was, I don't care. Or I don't know. One of the two. Surprise me. Well, his father <laughs> said, surprise me. Um, but once Herman was buried in this synagogue, uh, in this cemetery, and, and it's near a tree, and it's just beautiful. It just felt like that's a very peaceful place yeah. to die. It also sounds like you're saying it feels like family, significant yeah, yeah. family. You want to be with them yeah, forever. somehow, linked with them for eternity. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Zev, over the course of your career, you've worked in publishing, you've been a Jewish professional, you recently retired from 30 years as a teacher, you've been a psychologist. Would, would you say there are ways in which your Kabbalah experience helped um, shape your vision for yourself in terms of your professional life in any way? Mm, that's a hard one. It's a long one. For in me, public? sorry. For Go. me, I think it was independent. I, I, don't, I don't feel a connection. Maybe the only connection I feel is that because I have a practice in Teaneck, New Jersey, which has a very, very large Orthodox population and I have Orthodox patients, um, I think I can be of value to them because even though I don't practice the way they practice, I know what they know. In some cases, I know more. So when they, when they share issues, uh, in their family life or their religious life even, I know what they're talking about so I can like talk the same language. So in that way, I I'm sure that the Chavara has influenced me. Yeah. What about you, Seth? Well, in, in publishing, I don't think there was any spillover between my Chavara experience and, and publishing, but uh, yeah, when I was uh, trying to be a Jewish professional, I think there was, and there was a lot of uh, feeling I had that it could be done a different way, it could be done a better way, it didn't have to be done this way because I'd seen other models or at least I, I think out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, in teaching, uh, I think that my Chabra experience was um, vital. Uh, a lot of ways of relating to kids, uh, high school, inner city high school. Uh, um, I think I, I brought with me an attitude towards uh, authority, an attitude towards knowledge, an attitude toward a fellow human being uh, uh, that I, I think I owe to my, my, well, my, my comfort with the left, I suppose, generally, but uh, specifically in the Havara. Um And uh, I found also I, I could work uh, in group environments better. Uh, thanks to the the way we would carry on meetings in the Chavara. Uh and I found even a discomfort in kind of formal things like the, um, sometimes once in a while I still find myself in a meeting where I move I make a motion these kinds of things when we join the formal synagogue it's just uh, it, it's just not the way I see people thinking and I think I owe that somewhat to the Chavara. Uh but I, I saw different models uh, and uh, I, I'm grateful to the I think the Chavara did make me a better teacher yeah. Is there anything in the sort of pedagogic model that the Chavara uh, worked with and experimented with that, about the relationship between teacher and learner that has sort of made its way into your relationships with your students? Uh, I, I'd like to say yes, and I still look for it. Um, but no, because I was teaching high school and now I'm teaching undergraduates. And I think that kind of relationship, uh, the, the, the learner has to be on, uh, unless you're you know, really spiritually, I can learn from the way my, my, my 
15 year old ties his shoes, right? <laughs> but uh, I mean, I don't, no, not that way. But a sense of, you know, equality of all human beings, you know, and that I'm the real big shot just because I'm the teacher. The, you know, it, it's like, it, it makes me a lot less pompous, I think, the cover experience. It's a leveling experience. Leveling, and, and, and one's attitude towards authority, and the teacher does have a lot of authority. Uh, but the, the attitude toward authority, how to handle authority, I think I became sensitive to. But there's a matter of disposition, uh, temperament, I think, because uh, I mean, that's why I like the Chabarah, because of my temperament as far as that, mm -hmm. as that goes. So uh, it may not be causal, but I, I, I think the same kind of person who was pretty successful as an inner city teacher is the kind of person who enjoyed the Chabarah. That's fair. Yeah. Um, you still write poetry? Yes. Today? Yes, more than ever now. And that's another thing. I found a Chabarah of poets. And that's, that's like what also came into my life. So uh, looking all my life, and about five years ago, this is kind of online group, and they, we send around poems every two weeks to each other, and then we talk about them uh, online, and then we meet once a year, and we put together a little magazine. And uh, it's been such a uh, you know, great experience, and I'm on the committees and some of the committees, and uh, I remember not only the Chavra, but what in some ways I wanted the Chavra to be, that kind of thing of people sharing. Of course, we're all focused on poetry, and the Chavra was focused on a lot more other th different things. But the relationship I have to my fellow poets is something I'm really, I, it's something I brought from my, my Chavra experience. And I was looking for it in the Chavra. I mean, they weren't poets, so I didn't find it. Exactly. But, but there's that kind of relationship, and I'm very proud of it. How about for whom you write poetry? Does the Chavra figure in any way into whom you conceive of as your, as your audience or who you want to reach or touch with your poetry? Yeah, uh, a number of the people that I send my poems to first, before I even send them in uh, my group, are, are Chavara members. Oh, oh, oh yeah, Jay, well, Brim. Well, that's because those are the people he's known longest, the people he trusts the most. That's a friendship group. It's a, yeah, yeah, and that friendship group was the New York Chavara. Right, and they're not poets. You know, what's really telling for me is we've lived in New Jersey now for 36 years. And yet, when there's an important life cycle event, right. that's who we go to, our New York friends. Yeah. So finally, um, we're now just almost at the half century mark since the beginning of the first in American Jewish life, and what would you say have been the Chavarah's most important contributions and, and, and largest sort of spheres of impact? Hmm. Impact? Ch mm -hmm. Changing the way people think about Judaism. That's big. You know, um, that organized Jewish expression isn't the only way to be Jewish. And I think it's had a profound effect on, on uh, um, Jews throughout the country, Jews in synagogues throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's the Protestantization of the Jewish community. What do you mean? We're Protestant. Oh, come on. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look, Catholic <laughs> is top down. The Protestants, you know, the, the, they're, they're, it's a congregation and, they're, and it's a group and they relate to one another and nobody can say the one person has it better than the other. Uh, and they're reading text and that's where they, devour, they and they develop their faith through the community. Uh, no, I think that uh, that's seeping, the, the Protestantism is what's uh, seeping through into our way of looking at uh, religion and I think that's what the Chavarah stands for. Have you ever been to a mass? <laughs> It's top down. It's top First down. of all, it's top down. But besides that, it's like a Jewish service. They just lifted it. Not so. Well, it's like it's like a sacrifice. We have well, seen that, too. Like, that too. Um, well, it's formal, but there's that informality. You know, you think of like the the uh, New England where they're all singing. Now, of course, the the minister. But that minister, he had authority. But he, theologically, he was no higher than the others. He's not like a priest who is higher than the others. You know, the priest can really perform miracles every week. That's a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, a minister can't do that. No, it's a big difference. Yeah. And, and, and there's a d d democratization of, of Judaism. And I think it is a Protestant influence. I think I'm, I think I'm getting this from Kaplan, really. Well, I'm could, not intending it. You could be right. But it is a radical, right. it's a radical Americanization, you know. <laughs>
Radical, I like that. Radical yeah. Americanization. Of, of, of Judaism through Kaplan, but we've like gone one step beyond. So. Or even look at Kol Shaman in Israel. That's another um, uh, expression of, of the same feelings, basically. It's slightly different than what we have here, but the mentality is similar. You know, uh, participation of women, looking, looking at the, the community in a different way, stronger community feelings than used to be. Final words, Seth? No, I'm happy about this. Thanks a lot for the chance to talk about it and remember some stuff from 50 years ago. <laughs> Did you ever see, it's on uh, Netflix now, uh, it's an Israeli television series called Srugim. I have. You know the Srugim are? Mm -hmm. They're Nit yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so this is about a young Orthodox community in Jerusalem and how young Orthodox Jews try to negotiate the dating world while still being Orthodox. Okay, it's very interesting. One of the things that really struck me is that when these young people meet each other for the first time, one of the first things out of their mouths is, what synagogue do you belong to? You know, which my translation is, what's your community? Yeah. Who, who are you connected to? And by knowing who you're connected to, I know whether I'm going to be comfortable with you. Anyway, uh, I've seen only a couple of episodes, but there are four seasons of it if you get a chance to watch it. That sounds great. Well, I want to thank you both very much. It's been, it's been wonderful to talk to you today. And thank you so much for taking the time and sharing um, your memories and your reflections on Chaparral. Thank you. You're welcome.